Section 19 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4, Ecuador. Chapter 2, The Spanish Conquest. The fratricidal war lasting seven bloody years exhausted the resources of the northern and central provinces of the Inca Empire, and raised the spirit of factions to a bitter pitch. Hardly had the last battle been fought when Pizarro landed on the northern Peruvian coast. The moment could not have been more favorable. The story of Atahualpa's capture, of Pizarro's intrigues with the different Inca factions, and of his triumphal march to Cusco through a country distracted by civil feud, belongs rather to the history of Peru than of Ecuador. With Atahualpa's death and the defeat of Quisquis near Cusco, Quito was left without a master. The country had been drained of able-bodied men by Atahualpa's levies, and bands of troops who found their way back from Peru fought among themselves. The indefatigable Cañaris rose again against the Quito authorities, and following the fatal example set by the Huascar party in Peru, applied to the Spaniards. From San Miguel, the colony which Pizarro had established at Pura, in the valley where the roads from the Ecuador table land the Bautres into the coast plain, Sebastian de Benalcazar led a force of two hundred Spaniards to their assistance. Ascending the Cordillera, he was joined by great numbers of Indians in Loja, Cuenca, and Cañar, and crossed the Asuay before he encountered the meagre force of the Quito generals. Horses and firearms gave the Spaniards an easy victory, and their enemies retreated to the defences of Teocajas. This locality was once more fated to be the scene of a battle decisive of Ecuadorian history. Ben Alcazar and his allies were victorious, but at such a cost that he thought seriously of giving up the enterprise. Tradition recites that the giant volcano Cotopaxi burst forth into a terrific eruption after the battle, and that the midnight explosions were heard scores of miles along the plateau. To the Indians this was an infallible sign of the displeasure of the sun-god. Trembling with superstitious fear, they retreated in disorder. Ben Alcazar crossed Teocajas without resistance, and overran the country as far north as Quito, taking possession of the city in December 1533. Meanwhile Almagro had been hurrying up from Peru with reinforcements, and on his way along the plateau fell in with a third expedition under Alvarado, governor of guatemala coming from panama on his own account and landing on the coast a long distance north of guayaquil alvarado had succeeded in forcing his way through the dense forests and rain-soaked defiles and debouched on the plateau near riobamba almagro paid him one hundred thousand dollars to withdraw and ben alcazar was entrusted with the completion of the conquest he had so well begun disappointed in the search of gold Ben Alcazar divided the country into feudal lordships, enslaving the Indians and compelling them to pay tribute. His restless energy was not satisfied with the conquest of the old Cara kingdom, and he soon led an expedition of 150 Spaniards and 4,000 Indians against the coast provinces, and founded the city of Guayaquil, whose magnificent and sheltered port, the best on the Pacific coast, gave independent access to the sea. Though the passes leading from Guayaquil to Riobamba were far more tedious than the southern ones from Pura to Loja, they brought Quito two hundred miles nearer the ocean, and their use made Ecuador independent of northern Peru. Hardly had Ben Alcazar returned to the tableland and gone north to conquer southern Colombia, when the tribes near Guayaquil attacked and destroyed the settlement. His lieutenant at Quito dispatched another expedition. Pizarro sent reinforcements by sea, and the place was refounded. Again was it destroyed, and only in 1537, when Pizarro sent up Orellana with an adequate force, was a permanent settlement made on the site where today is the largest and richest city of Ecuador. Ben Alcazar had conquered Quito in the name and under the authority of Pizarro, and the latter now named his brother Gonzalo governor. Confident of finding another Peru in the unknown regions of the east of his new domain, the younger Pizarro enlisted hundreds of adventurers, 
and in the beginning of 1541 led the largest and best equipped expedition yet assembled in South America down the declivities of the Andes. Difficulties began as soon as he reached the sweltering, steaming forest region. Rain fell unceasingly. The soft clay of the defiles afforded no footing. Instead of finding stone highways like those over which they had marched in their conquest of the tableland, the Spaniards had to cut tracks along the mountain sides through the matted vegetation. Provisions ran short, clothes rotted, arms rusted, no villages or tribes possessing food were encountered. Finally, Gonzalo was obliged to halt the main army, sending a detachment under Orellana, the second in command, on ahead to find provisions. Orellana followed down a stream which soon grew large enough to be navigable. He built boats and proceeded, but still found no signs of civilized inhabitants. Fearing that he could never ascend the river to the main body, he determined to keep on, confident that ultimately he must reach the ocean. The river he was descending is now called the Napo. After a course of nearly a thousand miles, it flowed into the Amazon, and down the latter's broad current, Orellana and his little band floated to the Atlantic, there built a little ship, and finally made their way to Spain. Hearing nothing of Orellana, Gonzalo gave up and climbed back to Quito, with a starving and naked remnant of his men. There he learned of the assassination of his great brother at Lima, and that Vaca de Castro, the royal commissioner appointed to settle the disputes between the partisans of Almagro and Pizarro, had passed through Ecuador on his way south to Peru, appointing another governor for Quito. Gonzalo retired to Charcas in southern Bolivia, whence he emerged a year later to head the great rebellion. The viceroy was compelled to fly from Lima, and landing at Tumbeth made his way to Quito. The Spaniards in Ecuador and southern Colombia were against Pizarro, but the latter chased the viceroy out of Quito and north into Papayan, where Ben Alcazar took sides with him. Four hundred Spaniards accompanied the viceroy in a counter-invasion, but near the city he was completely defeated and decapitated as he lay wounded on the field. Gonzalo, now undisputed lord of the whole Inca empire, returned at his leisure to Lima. The tale of how Gasca, shrewd old priest, by intrigue and conciliation, re-established royal authority and brought Pizarro to the scaffold does not especially affect the history of Ecuador. By 1550 the civil wars were over, the unruly original conquistadors had been executed, banished, or reduced to obedience. Shortly afterward, the system of Indian tribute and slavery was modified, so that although the proprietors got rich, the aborigines were saved from rapid extermination, royal officials and functionaries were installed, an elaborate system of taxation established, and Ecuador, with the rest of Spanish America, entered upon a long period of exploitation under form of law, instead of being the haphazard prey of irresponsible private adventurers. For the next 250 years, Ecuador has no history. The occasional eruption of a volcano or an Indian insurrection is all one finds in the annals, except the interminable lists of the Spanish officials sent out to enrich themselves and the crown at the expense of the hapless Indians. The Spanish occupation brought about no colonization of Ecuador in the true sense of that word, although it worked a considerable revolution in the life and customs of the Indians who continued to constitute the bulk of the population. Indeed, the habitable area of the Andean plateau was so limited, and the aboriginal population so numerous, that there was no room for immigration without a war of extermination. The cultivable area of Andean Ecuador barely exceeds 8,000 square miles, and it is probable that more than a million natives lived there in the time of the Caras and Incas. Even at the present day, these 8,000 miles contain more than two-thirds of the total population, and not more than 400,000 people inhabit the 280,000 square miles of high barren mountains, steep declivities of the Cordillera, and wooded plains on the coast and in the Amazon Valley, which constitute the remainder of Ecuador. 
One of the important results of the Spanish occupation was the introduction of new food plants and domestic animals. Wheat and barley were early planted by the Castilian proprietors who had divided the country among themselves, and these grains quickly replaced the quinoa which, with the potato, had been the chief reliance of the Caras. The cultivation of the potato and also of maize was, however, continued. The Spanish invaders introduced the plantain and banana, which immediately became the staples of the forested and tropical districts, making possible a great increase of population. The plateau was found suited to European fruits, and orchards were soon flourishing in its more favoured parts. Rice, indigo and sugar cane were also introduced, and an export trade in these articles grew up, as well as in the natives cacao and sarsaparilla. The Spanish rulers effected radical changes in the political, social and religious life of the civilized Indians. A certain apathy and fatalism seems characteristic of the American aborigine, and in Ecuador, trained through countless centuries to the patriarchal rule of his own chiefs, he submitted to the exactions and innovations of his new masters. According to Spanish constitutional law and practice, America was not a component part of the mother kingdom, but the new continent was regarded as the personal property of the King of Castile, its lands, mines and inhabitants being his to dispose of at pleasure. The viceroy at Lima was the monarch's lieutenant, only responsible to the king himself or to the advisory board known as the Council of the Indies. For great territorial divisions, like Ecuador, this power was delegated to governors, and the corregidors were likewise unrestrained within the smaller subdivisions. The Indians were regarded as mere chattel, and the tribute exacted from every adult was a logical consequence of their legal status. In theory, even the Spanish residents had no rights to self-government, nor did any constitutional guarantees of life or property exist. But such a despotism largely existed only on paper. The Spaniards who came to South America brought with them their characteristic constitutional traditions and personal independence. Instinctively they flocked into cities and organized municipal governments after the time-honored Spanish form. So a system came into existence which had the sanction of the people's cooperation and was therefore workable. The country districts were left to the Indians, and as long as they paid their tribute to the crown or to the Spaniards who claimed the land they tilled, little heed was paid to the form of civil government among them. The influence of their hereditary chiefs survived for centuries, and their old laws and customs died out only by degrees. In the cities, contact between Spaniards and Indians was closer. In process of time, the increasing number of half-breeds aided in the process of amalgamation, and even the pure-blood Indians of the fields and villages learned much of what their masters had to teach them. The church, however, operated more powerfully than any other influence in making Ecuador Spanish. Within a few years after the conquest, a regular bishopric was established in Quito, and hundreds of priests and friars flocked over to take part in the wholesale evangelization of the heathen natives. The gospel was preached everywhere. Churches and chapels built in even the smallest villages, the obdurate Indians were treated with scan ceremony, and it soon became well understood among the natives that a hearty acceptance of the Christian cult tended to keep them out of trouble. Ecuador quickly became one of the most devotedly Catholic countries in the world, and has ever since remained so. The crown and the landed proprietors made lavish gifts to the cause of religion, and a great proportion of the property of the country ultimately fell into the hands of the religious orders. Quito has appropriately been called the city of convents, and if we are to believe the accounts of travellers in colonial times, half the population must have been priests, monks, and nuns. The introduction of Christianity among the Indians aided powerfully in spreading a knowledge of the Spanish language, but was more effective in substituting the Quechua for the ancient local tongues. The evangelists found it easier to preach to all the tribes in one language, 
and Quichua was naturally chosen, since it was already in the most general use as the official medium of the Inca Empire. The Spanish priests reduced it to written form, and it became a lingua franca which was understood among all the nations of the Andean plateau very much as Guarani was among the Indians of the Atlantic slope. The details of Spanish civil, military, and financial administration in Ecuador did not differ greatly from those in the other provinces, and there is no need to repeat them here. The peaceable character of the Ecuador Indians made the maintenance of a standing army or even of a militia unnecessary. A few companies of troops in each of the principal towns and the natural military aptitude of the Spanish residents was sufficient to suppress any symptoms of rebellion and to keep the Indians at work for their masters. Happily for the natives, no great finds of silver or gold were made except in the southern province of Loja, and forced labor in the mines did not decimate the population, as happened in Bolivia and parts of Peru. Spaniards did not emigrate to any considerable extent, and Negro slavery flourished on the sea coast. The only schools were priest seminaries, in which little except theology was taught, and the level of intellectual culture among the Creoles sank very low. Taxes were heavy, public employments and titles of nobility were openly sold by the government, commerce amounted to little, because little gold and silver was mined, and other articles would not bear the heavy transportation charges and the exactions of restrictions of the Spanish colonial system. The magnificent stone highways which the Cara and Inca monarchs had built were allowed to fall into ruins, but their remnants are to be seen even to this day on the tableland near Cuenca, still solid in spite of the storms and earthquakes of four centuries. Population on the plateau slowly decreased. Quito had been a great city, while it was the Cara capital, the residence of Huayna Capac and Atahualpa, and in 1735 Ulloa estimated that it contained over 70,000 people, but at the end of the 18th century it had fallen to less than 40,000. However, the introduction of the plantain undoubtedly brought about an increase of population in the coast provinces, and Guayaquil flourished with the cultivation of cacao and sugar cane. No great figure of a soldier, reformer, or administrator stands out among all the hundreds of officials who were sent over from Spain to rule the country. Even records of the growth of jealousies between Spaniards and Creoles, such as we encounter in other countries of South America, are wanting. The Creoles appear never to have been able to interrupt the monotonous course of Spanish administration. In 1564, the old kingdom of Quito, with the addition of some outlying Colombian and Peruvian provinces, was erected into a presidency, and a royal audiencia, or court of appeals, with important administrative functions, was established. The viceroy of Lima continued to exercise nominal jurisdiction over all Spanish South America until the year 1719, when the viceroyalty of New Granada was first created. The Quito presidency was attached to the new jurisdiction, and this emphasized the separation from Peru. Twelve hundred miles of crooked, wretched road intervened between Quito and Lima, while the distance to Bogotá was less than half as great. However, the natural outlet for the plateau from Cuenca north to Papayan was the road to Guayaquil, and the Quito presidency was therefore coextensive with a natural commercial subdivision of the continent. In 1736, a party of scientists commissioned by the King of France came to Quito for the purpose of measuring an arc of the Earth's meridian at the equator. These savants erected two pyramids to serve as a permanent record of the line they had measured, and placed upon them an inscription stating that the work had been done under the patronage of the King of France. Years afterwards, a Spanish official, offended in his national pride by the wording of the inscription, obtained an order from Madrid for the destruction of these monuments, so invaluable to the science of exact geography. The latter part of the 18th century was marked by a greater interest in education. The seminaries widened their courses of study to include something more than the canon law and the fathers. 
and public-spirited creoles endowed new and better institutions of learning. No press or periodical literature appeared, but poetry and belles lettres were cultivated with some success by native authors. Though the expulsion of the Jesuits in 1765 was accomplished without bloodshed, it resulted in no material weakening of ecclesiastical influence. The revolutionary ideas which were transforming the political thought of the world during the 18th century hardly penetrated Ecuador at all, and whatever influence they had was confined to the small percentage of the population that boasted of non-Indian blood. The news of Lexington and Yorktown, and the enfranchisement of British North America, stimulated no similar movement among the patient Indians and devout Creoles of the Andean valleys, and even the tremendous cataclysm of the French Revolution passed almost unnoticed. End of section 19section twenty of the south american republics volume two by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part four ecuador chapter three the war of independence the beginning of the nineteenth century saw spain involved to her ruin in the tremendous struggle between napoleon and his enemies her fleets were destroyed at san vincent and trafalgar her treasury was emptied her administration demoralized free communication with her american colonies was impossible while british frigates commanded every sea and both on the peninsula and in america spanish subjects lost their traditional respect for the monarchy though the jealousy against their important rulers which always fermented among creoles was not so strong in quiet isolated and agricultural ecuador as in the coast provinces and mining regions the news of Spain's defeats and humiliations awakened ambitious lawyers and wealthy landowners to a realization that the Spaniards might be ousted from the lucrative offices. The opportunity came in 1809 with the resignation of Charles V, the deposition and imprisonment of Ferdinand VII, the usurpation of the Spanish throne by Joseph Bonaparte, and the occupation of the peninsula by the French. The viceroys and governors of Spanish America refused to recognize Joseph. The many patriots on the peninsula who resisted the French usurpation organized provisional juntas which assumed to be the supreme depositaries of power pending the expulsion of Joseph and the return of Ferdinand, while the queen claimed a regency for herself. The Spanish authorities did not know who would come out on top, and were principally anxious to maintain themselves in their places, while ambitious leaders among the Creoles immediately began to plot to turn the confusion to their own advantage, and to secure autonomy and even independence for the colonies. In 1809, Don Ruiz de Castilla was president of Quito. His jurisdiction included not only all present Ecuador, but also the southern part of Colombia, extending north 300 miles along the great Andean plateau through the populous regions of Pasto and Papayan, and far down the high and fertile valley of the Cauca. These portions of Colombia are continuous with the table land on which Quito stands, and directly accessible therefrom, while they are separated from the parallel series of plateaus on which Bogota, Tunja, and Socorro lie, by the deep valley of the Magdalena. Castilla's dependence upon the Bogota Viceroy was therefore largely nominal, and he could expect as little help from New Granada as from Peru. He had only a few troops at Quito, probably not more than two or three hundred, while the governors of the subordinate provinces, Popayan, Guayaquil, and Cuenca, each could muster only a few dozen armed police. A number of wealthy Creole proprietors and restless lawyers determined in the early part of 1809 to overthrow the president and create a governing junta composed of residents of Ecuador. Castilla was powerless to avert the storm. The handful of troops in barracks was easily suborned by the conspirators, who included the persons of greatest wealth, intelligence, and influence in the community. The mass of the Indian population was inert and would naturally side with their landlords, while the Spanish residents and Creole Tories had formed no plans for common action. 
On the night of the 9th of August, 1809, the chiefs of the movement, with the officers of the troops, met in the house of Doña Manuela Canizares, the Madame Roland of Ecuador, and assigned to each the role which he was to play in the coup d'etat. The officers went to the barracks, let out the troops, and took possession of the government buildings in the name of the Revolutionist Committee. The President and those Spanish officials who proved recalcitrant were imprisoned. A governing junta of nine, with Juan Montufar as chief, was appointed, and an open cabildo summoned, which confirmed these acts. The junta notified the viceroys of Bogotá and Lima that it had assumed the government, and sent messengers to the provincial capitals demanding that they expel their Spanish authorities, adhere to the new order of things, and recognize the supremacy of the Quito junta. But the movement met with no favorable response from the rest of the presidency. The governors of Popayán, Cuenca, and Guayaquil immediately began to enlist troops to defend themselves against an attack from Quito. The junta prepared for war, but though plenty of ambitious young Creoles volunteered as officers, there were no firearms enough to go round. At last an expedition set off to the north against Pasto and Popayán, only to be easily defeated by the hasty levies the Spanish authorities had made among the sturdy Indians of these regions. Frightened by this defeat and their hopeless isolation, the junta resigned under promise of amnesty, and in October Castilla returned to Quito and resumed the reins of government. But his position was insecure, and rumours of a fresh conspiracy soon drove him to repressive measures and the imprisonment of leading Creoles. The feeling grew bitter, and in August 1810 a desperate effort was made by the Creoles to get possession of the barracks. Its failure was followed by a frightful massacre in which many of the most popular men in the place were murdered. Meanwhile, the Supreme Junta at Seville, anxious to pacify the revolutionary disorders, had commissioned Carlos Montufar, a son of the chief of the fallen Quito Junta, who then happened to be in Spain, to go to Ecuador and reconcile the factions. Under his advice, Castilla resigned to a new junta the direction of affairs, taking, however, the position of its chief member, and sent away his troops. In reality, the younger Montufar sympathized with his brother Creoles. The universal indignation at the massacre of 1810 pushed him on to vengeance. Spaniards travelling through the country were waylaid and assassinated, and by the time Molina, appointed by the Spanish government in Castilla's place, had reached Cuenca on its way north to Quito, the old governor had again been deposed and imprisoned, and open war existed between Arredondo, the Spaniard commanding the troops who had retired from Quito in accordance with the compromise, and the junta in the latter city. The year 1811 passed without any material change in the situation. The Spanish generals controlled Guayaquil and Cuenca in the south, and Pasto and Popayán in the north, practically isolating the revolutionary government at Quito. As the troops of both sides became better trained, the war took on a more determined and cruel character. Royalists and revolutionists both raised recruits among the sturdy mountain Indians and half-breeds. In technical knowledge of their profession, the Spanish officers were superior to the revolutionary leaders and could procure arms more readily. Their armies were usually better disciplined and more efficient, although more liable to depletion by desertion. In this state of perpetual war, government rapidly became exclusively military. On the surface, the contest seemed only a struggle between two sets of independent chiefs, in whose mouths liberty and loyalty were mere catchwords, and who continually quarrelled among themselves even when they nominally belonged to the same side. Early in 1812, Montufar was overthrown by another Creole chief in Quito, who thereupon undertook an expedition against the Spanish general at Cuenca but sedition among the patriot troops gave an easy victory to the latter and the spaniards took the offensive marching toward quito they dispersed the patriot army at mocha and entered the capital in triumph montes the spanish general who now became ruler of the presidency was a wise and moderate man 
and spared no pains to conciliate. He soon succeeded in so completely consolidating his power that during nine years Quito and most of the presidency remained quietly submissive and became one of the centres whence Spain expeditions went out against the parts of the continent which still remained in revolution. An able general, Samano by name, carried the successes of the Spanish arms to the north, and although the patriots of Colombia obtained some temporary advantages in the winter of 1814-1815, they never penetrated south of Pasto. In 1816 the tide again turned with the arrival of 1100 Spanish veterans in the north of Colombia. The patriots were soon everywhere defeated, Bogotá itself taken, and a remnant of revolutionists who attempted the invasion of Papayán and Pasto were overwhelmed by Samano in 1816 at the Battle of Tambo. The patriot cause was at its lowest ebb in all South America. Resistance ceased in Colombia. Only a few scattered bands kept up a desultory warfare in Venezuela. Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia were quiet. Spanish authority had been re-established in Chile, Uruguay had fallen into the hands of the Portuguese king, and Spanish armies were invading the Argentine, the last refuge of the revolution. San Martin's thunderbolt descended upon Chile, and his victory at Chacabuco changed the aspect of affairs. A fleet was improvised at Valparaiso, which obtained command of the Pacific coast, cutting off the Spaniards in Ecuador from receiving supplies except overland from the Caribbean ports. Bolivar took new heart for his tedious task of arousing the north and driving the Spaniards from Venezuela and New Granada. In 1819 he climbed the east side of the Andes to the neighborhood of Bogotá, and by defeating the Spanish army at Boyacá, freed most of the present Colombia, and even in Quito the patriots renewed their revolutionary plotting. Meanwhile San Martin had completed the expulsion of the Spaniards from Chile, and in 1820 he transported an army by sea to the neighborhood of Lima itself, opening communications with the anti-Spanish party all along the coast. On the 9th of October 1820 a successful revolution broke out at Guayaquil, and little time was lost in sending an army to the plateau. The Spaniards defeated it, but with Bolivar threatening them from Colombia, their comrades in Peru fighting for their lives against San Martin, the population of Quito on the verge of a revolt, and the Pacific in the control of the patriots, they could not follow up their advantage. On June 24, 1821, Bolivar gained the crowning victory of Carabobo in Venezuela. The Spanish position in the Caribbean provinces became irretrievable, and the Patriot General was thenceforth free to pursue his plans for the expulsion of the enemy from southern New Granada and Ecuador, and their incorporation with Colombia. In the fall of that year, General Sucre, who shares with San Martin the honor of being the greatest soldier on the Patriot side, arrived at Guayaquil by sea, bringing with him 1,700 Colombian and Venezuelan veterans. Bolivar was to advance from Bogotá, conquering Papayán and Pasto on his way to Quito, while Sucre came up from the south. The latter at once ascended the Andes to the plateau, but was badly defeated. Retreating to Guayaquil, he reorganized his army, incorporating with it a reinforcement of 1,200 men sent by San Martín, and again climbed the Andes. By this time, Bolivar was advancing from Papayán to Pasto, and the Spaniards, Thinking it best to concentrate their forces, abandoned Cuenca and the southern provinces, and allowed Sucre to advance unopposed to the neighborhood of Quito. There he outmaneuvered them and gained a commanding position on the slopes of the great volcano Pichincha, overlooking the city. His foes were forced to the alternative of giving battle at a disadvantage, or permitting him to effect a junction with Bolivar and overwhelming them by superior numbers. On the morning of the 24th of May, 1822, the battle decisive of Ecuador's fate was fought. The royal army suffered annihilation. Four hundred dead lay on the mountainside and two hundred wounded. Eleven hundred men and one hundred and sixty officers surrendered the following day. 
the only troops who escaped belonged to scattered detachments not present at the battle, who fled down the eastern slope of the Andes into the trackless forests, and finally made their way down the Amazon to the Atlantic. End of section 20section twenty one of the south american republics volume two by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part four ecuador chapter four the formation of ecuador at the head of a victorious army of colombians and argentines sucre could naturally do as he liked with ecuador and an assembly of the people of quito accepted incorporation into the republic of colombia bolivar meanwhile had had some hard fighting with the stubborn loyalists of pasto and the issue remained doubtful until news of the victory of pichincha was received the spanish commander surrendered bolivar came on to quito and thence proceeded to guayaquil the inhabitants of this important city were divided many wanted to be independent others preferred incorporation with peru to being tied up with colombia a country whose capital could only be reached by months of tedious travelling others however were willing to maintain the ancient political connection with new granada as a matter of fact discussion was useless for bolivar threw into the scale the weight of his military power guayaquil and the adjacent coast region became a department of colombia while the southern plateau provinces cuenca and loja were also erected into a department of bolivar's vast confederation this completed the division of the old presidency of quito into four parts pasto and the northern provinces quito and the central cuenca and the northern and guayaquil with the coast and in all of them the influence of bolivar's satraps was predominant shortly after his arrival at guayaquil bolivar and san martin had their famous interview the latter came up from lima hoping to arrange plan of joint campaign but he quickly saw that bolivar would never consent to share the glory of driving the spaniards from their last stronghold the great argentine magnanimously determined to retire and returning to lima resigned the presidency of peru san martin once out of the way bolivar was eager to lead a colombian army to lima but the peruvians declined his assistance alone however they had little chance against the able spanish generals and aghast at the progress of the enemy they soon sent to bolivar begging his assistance on his own terms the selfishly ambitious liberator gladly accepted and within a month sucre was on his way south at the head of a fine army of colombian veterans bolivar himself followed with reinforcements and though hampered and delayed by the revolt of the callao garrison sucre's military ability backed by bolivar's tireless energy and large resources produced their legitimate results bolivar in person advanced to the plateau and august sixth eighteen twenty four won the cavalry action of junin which compelled the retirement of the spanish army to cuzco bolivar returned to lima leaving sucre in command and on the ninth of december the latter annihilated the main body of the enemy in the battle of ayacucho the crowning victory of the war of south american independence bolivar was supreme from the caribbean to potosi as president of the united states of colombia he ruled venezuela new granada and ecuador he himself was dictator of peru and his faithful lieutenant exercised supreme power in bolivia the realization of his cherished plan for the union of all south america into one great confederacy with himself as life president seemed near at hand but successful soldier though he was heroic resourceful and unwavering in reverse his statecraft was short-sighted and impracticable the moment of his apogee marked the beginning of his decline he failed to appreciate that the spirit of south america was profoundly democratic and local and that the war of independence owed its beginning and successful prosecution to a deeply rooted impulse toward division liberty and anarchy among the creoles to build a tower out of sand would have been easier than to create a stable union between the recently liberated provinces of spanish america viewed in the light of subsequent events the wonder is that the territorial disintegration stopped where it did and that south america did not split into twenty instead of nine separate countries 
Bolívar's partisans in Columbia were unsuccessful in their intrigues to replace the constitution of Cucuta with one drawn up after the plan their chief had imposed upon Bolivia and Peru. Neither leaders nor people, army nor professional classes, showed any disposition to concede him greater powers. His attempts to interfere in the affairs of Argentine and Chile were repulsed. Peru became restless under his dictatorship. Bolivia only waited a favorable opportunity to expel Sucre. The very troops he had brought from Colombia to Peru became mutinous. His Pan-American Congress at Panama turned out a fiasco. He remained two years in Peru until the news of a great uprising in Venezuela made it necessary for him to hurry to the north. Hardly had he left Lima than the military chiefs in Peru virtually disavowed his authority. Under the leadership of their officers, the Colombian troops in Lima revolted, and the Peruvians, delighted to be rid of these embarrassing guests, paid their pecuniary demands, and to the number of over three thousand, dispatched them in ships for the north. They disembarked in Ecuador, where one division took possession of Guayaquil and another of Cuenca. Bolivar was so occupied with the troubles in Venezuela that he could personally take no measures against this defection. But General Flores, a Venezuelan, whom he had appointed commander of the military forces of the three southern provinces of the old Quito presidency, Guayaquil, Cuenca, and Quito, proved energetic and fortunate. His intrigues sowed discord among the officers of the revolting troops. A counter-revolution occurred in his favor at Cuenca, and after a short period of virtual independence, Guayaquil also returned to its old connection with Quito. The movement against Bolivar from Colombia proper involved Pasto and Popayán, the northern division of the old Quito presidency, while Quito and the southern provinces were left largely to their own devices. General Lamar, who had succeeded in making himself president of Peru, conceived the idea of enlarging the limits of that country by the acquisition of Guayaquil and Cuenca, and he was the more enthusiastic because the latter was his native province. In 1828, war broke out between Colombia and Peru. Peruvian ships blockaded Guayaquil, and in January 1829 forced the surrender of that place, while a Peruvian army 7,000 strong invaded the Ecuadorian plateau and penetrated beyond Cuenca. Flores and his rivals united in force of the common danger. The Colombian veterans scattered throughout the country rallied to the banner of Sucre, who came in person to take command, and the decisive battle was fought at Tarqui in February. The Peruvians were so badly defeated that they sued for peace, and agreed to surrender Guayaquil and the greater part of the southern provinces. By this time, however, Bolivar's own position had become desperate. Venezuela had already separated from the Confederation, and when on the 12th of May, 1830, Flores proclaimed the Quito presidency independent, it was little more than the announcement of an existing fact. He attempted to disarm jealousy against Quito by christening the country by the fanciful name of Ecuador, and by decreeing that each province should have an equal vote in the legislative assembly. Flores was merely one of a multitude of military chiefs who had been fighting among themselves since the expulsion of the Spaniards. Though married to a Quito lady, he was a Venezuelan and could rely on few local friendships or sympathies, and the Colombian veterans, who swarmed over the country, devouring the substance of the people and eager for pay and plunder, regarded him as one of themselves and were ready to desert him for any chief who might offer higher wages. Now that Bolivar was overthrown and Sucre murdered on a lonely mountain road by hired assassins, the sentiment of loyalty to their own chiefs tardily revived among the fickle Colombian regulars. They received Flores's declaration of independence with indignation. An insurrection broke out among the garrison at Guayaquil, and the veterans marched to the plateau. Flores had no force capable of making headway against them, and was compelled to negotiate a treaty, agreeing to support Bolivar in case the latter should remain in South America. On the other hand, the troops consented to recognize Flores if Bolivar should go into exile. Hardly had the treaty been signed 
than word was received of the lonely death of the great Venezuelan at Santa Marta. Most of the veterans took service under Flores, and he pursued the recalcitrants with relentless and bloody severity. Pasto and Popayán, composing the province of Cauca, the northern division of the old Quito presidency, wavered as to whether they would cast their lot with Ecuador or New Granada. The government at Bogotá sent an army into the disputed territory, and Flores tried to organize a force large enough to beat it, but he was hampered by mutinies, conspiracies, and poverty, and after a year of expensive, though nearly bloodless operations, withdrew and consented to a treaty, by which Ecuador gave up all claim to Pasto and Papayan, losing a third of the territory and population of the old presidency of Quito. Flores, however, managed to hold Guayaquil and Cuenca, as well as Quito, and must therefore be regarded as the founder of Ecuador, though his reactionary, absolute, and violent government was hated by all that was young, intelligent, and liberal in the country. The Indian peasants groaned under the burden of taxes imposed to subsidize a horde of functionaries. Finances were in deplorable confusion. The public debts left unpaid. Population decreased, especially in the Andean region. Agriculture, industry, and commerce remained stationary, except in the cacao districts on the coast. The lower classes had a hard struggle for bare existence, and the parasitical ruling race was solely preoccupied with political war and intrigue. It cannot fairly be said that Flores or any other one man was responsible. The lamentable condition of affairs resulted inevitably from the long struggle with Spain and from the situation, character, and ideals of the people. But such a Janissary system of government was too burdensome, unwieldy, and wasteful not to fall by its own weight sooner or later. The people were simply unable to pay the taxes which Flores levied vainly trying to satisfy his troops. Mutinies broke out among the latter, and the liberals were encouraged to organize. A revolutionary society was formed in Quito, whose ramifications extended among the enthusiastic youth in every part of the republic. In Guayaquil, the wealthiest and most commercial city, the demand for better financial administration became universal. In 1833, Vicente Rocapuerte, the foremost of Ecuadorian liberals, and the most accomplished public man in the country, openly assumed the leadership of the opposition to Flores. Elected a member of Congress, he bravely defied the dictator, who sentenced him to banishment. But when he reached Guayaquil, the troops and citizens of that city arose to support him. Flores led an army down the Andes, and attacked and captured Guayaquil. Rocafuerte and his partisans escaped and kept up the struggle at different points of the coast, while sympathetic insurrections broke out on the plateau in Flores's rear. Though the dictator finally succeeded in capturing Rocafuerte, the only use he was able to make of his victory was to secure better terms from the liberals. Rocafuerte and he formed an alliance, and together they pacified the country, the former becoming president and the latter retaining command of the army. Ecuador enjoyed her first real respite from civil war and tumult since 1809, and Rocafuerte's inauguration in 1835 marks the beginning of civil and constitutional governments. End of section 21《セクション22 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4, Ecuador. Chapter 5, Modern Ecuador. President Rocafuerte was not only animated by revolutionary principles, imbued with liberal ideas, and a student of the best political and economic writers, but he proved to be a good administrator, practical, cautious, and sure and earned the title of the greatest of Ecuador's reformers. His first step was to summon a constituent assembly, which divided the country into provinces and parishes, outlined a rational scheme of administration, and made a substantial beginning towards substituting civil for military government. Although he did not attempt to carry into practice the dreams of radical liberals, impracticable among a population nine-tenths Indians in semi-bondage, and in a country where the clergy were dominant, 
he reformed the taxing system, set in order the finances, so far as his means and knowledge would permit, earnestly encouraged industry, agriculture, and commerce, repaired and built roads, promulgated a new and humane criminal code, and established schools. He set up the pyramids of the French geographers, showing that tender regard for his country's repute abroad, which is rarely absent in statesmen of high character and noble aims. Under his administration, Ecuador assumed the payment of her proportion, 21.5% of 1,800,000 pounds of the debt contracted by the defunct United States of Colombia during the War of Independence. However, this debt proved a burden too great for her resources. Interest fell behind, and the principal has been scaled down repeatedly. Only in 1900 was an arrangement satisfactory to the bondholders finally reached. His efforts made Ecuador the second South American Republic whose independence was formally recognized by Spain. In religious matters he proved true to his liberal convictions, and while never persecuting the clergy, always advocated religious freedom for the individual. But though he set his country's feet in the path of progress, the steps were slow, short, and uncertain. His alliance with the military element, as represented by Flores, and the religious and social conservatism of the bulk of the people, hampered rapid progress. The radical liberals conspired against him, but their plots were sternly stamped out. Government remained essentially military and aristocratic, and active participation was confined to the educated and military classes. Nevertheless, a sort of equilibrium between the demands of the governing caste and the capacities of the producing masses was reached, and a certain degree of order replaced the indiscriminate exactions and tyranny which the proletariat had endured ever since the first Spaniard had landed. When Rocafuerte finished his term in 1839, Ecuador was at peace and had recovered much of the material prosperity lost during the long wars. On the plateau the Indians cultivated their wheat and potatoes in security, while on the low coast lands the cacao industry flourished, making Ecuador one of the chief sources of the world's supply of chocolate, and multiplying Guayaquil's population and wealth. Flores's command of the army ensured him the succession to the presidency. Though his return to power meant political reaction, the beneficent effects of Rocafuerte's system had been too obvious to be entirely ignored and hastily abandoned. Flores's first measures were moderate, but his irrational ambition quickly led him into an expensive and fruitless intervention in, in the Colombian Civil War of 1840. His financial difficulties and a return to military habits caused him to adopt measures continually more arbitrary, and he went stubbornly ahead with his schemes to make his dictatorship permanent. He forced the adoption of a new constitution, lengthening the presidential term to eight years, and caused himself to be declared elected in 1843. The conflict with the liberals became acute. Rocafuerte protested and was forced to fly for his life. The young radicals of Quito plotted the tyrant's assassination, while the villagers of the plateau arose in revolt against the gatherers of an obnoxious poll tax. In 1845, a liberal revolution broke out at Guayaquil. Flores descended from the tableland, but the liberal army met and defeated him at the foot of the mountains, and he accepted the offer of $20,000 in cash and a pension to leave the country. The better elements of the triumphant party were not able to keep the upper hand, a new constitution was hastily adopted, and the mulatto Ramon Roca installed as president. For four years he ruled, while the gulf between liberals and conservatives widened day by day, and factional jealousies and ambitions within the dominant party became menacing. The Congress of 1849 quarrelled bitterly over the presidential succession, and was unable to agree on anyone. Ambitious chiefs got arms and men together, and after a year of uncertainty, General Urbina of Guayaquil issued a pronunciamento declaring Diego Noboa provisional head of the government. A convention called for the purpose, adopted a new constitution, and elected Urbina's nominee president for the full term. 
To the consternation of the Liberals he recalled the Jesuits and gave asylum to the defeated Conservatives from Columbia, going so far as to send troops to the frontier to aid in their restoration. But Urbina, to whose command these forces had been entrusted, proclaimed himself Dictator and exiled Noboa. He promulgated a new constitution, Ecuador's sixth in 22 years, persecuted the Conservatives and ruled for four years as an ultra-liberal. At the expiration of his term in 1856, he named his friend Robles as his successor, who maintained himself against the conservative attacks until, in 1859, his government became involved in a war with Peru. When Robles and Urbina went to the Peruvian frontier, the conservatives rose behind them. As a matter of fact, the country was tired of the misrule of the military chiefs, miscalled liberals, whose government was a compound of oppression for their enemies and license for their friends. The clericals armed their adherents in the northern villages and marched on Quito. The partisans of the administration at the capital could oppose no effective resistance, and the insurgents entered the city, and on May 1st installed a provisional government with Garcia Moreno at its head. The latter at once pushed on south with a small force, and though defeated by Robles, he escaped to Peru, where he received help for new operations. In spite of Moreno's temporary reverse, his friends retained possession of Quito, and the Peruvian blockade of Guayaquil absorbed the president's attention. The forces under Robles soon crumbled away, and he resigned and went into banishment. Urbina, the real chief of the Liberal Party, had a small body of troops in Cuenca, with which he tried to maintain the unequal contest but his position soon became untenable, and he followed Robles into exile. Moreno was now master of the whole Andean region. Guayaquil, however, remained in the hands of a liberal chief. The Peruvian government had tired of its bargain to support the Ecuadorian clericals. The blockade was abandoned, and the Peruvian ships retired after making a treaty with the Guayaquil authorities. This rid Moreno of an embarrassing entanglement with a foreign power, although it left the Guayaquil insurgents free to employ all their forces against him. Descending with all the forces he could muster, his mountaineers defeated the coast troops in every encounter, and on the 2nd of September 1860 Moreno captured the great seaport, putting an end to open opposition in all Ecuador. Every successful revolutionist in those days made his own constitution, so it is a waste of words to tell that Moreno summoned a convention which promulgated a new fundamental law for the Republic. During the next fifteen years he remained the dominant personality in Ecuadorian history. His biography is typical of the careers of the higher class of Creole statesmen and profoundly interesting to a student of South American history as illustrating the difficulties with which men of constructive minds and the passion for order have been obliged to contend. A scion of one of the oldest and proudest Spanish families, he had been proscribed in his youth and spent the years of his exile studying in the old world. He returned with his naturally fine mind stored with the fruits of study and observation, but with his prejudices of caste and religion unshaken. The clericals set all their hopes on this brilliant young advocate, and his public life, his opinions and his personality resume the reactionary characteristics of Ecuador. Nevertheless, it is hard for an unprejudiced outsider to study the history of his country during his time without retaining a strong admiration for his abilities and force, even if not convinced that his career made for the moral uplifting of the Republic. He found the finances in a wretched state, salaries were unpaid, the revenue amounted to less than a million pesos, and the government was living from hand to mouth on 20% loans. He directed his activity principally towards effecting urgent material reforms, increasing the revenue by systemizing taxation, suppressing frauds and contraband, funding a mint and hospital at Quito, building the great wagon road from Quito to the southern provinces, and connecting that remote and mountain-locked capital by a telegraph line with Guayaquil. The whole of his own salary he devoted to the public use. The laws were better enforced, life and property became safer, and material prosperity increased. The government was centralized, 
the semi-independency of the departments abolished, the Jesuits recalled, the rights and privileges of the clergy restored and increased, and a concordat signed with the Holy See, which virtually freed the Ecuadorian Church from all secular control. The concordat was denounced throughout the continent as treason to South American independence, and his relations with European diplomatic representatives were so cordial and frank that rumours of his willingness to accept a foreign protectorate, or even annexation by Spain, were rife in the other capitals. The publication of his personal correspondence with a French diplomatist raised such a storm against him that other countries plotted his overthrow, and the Democrats of Colombia, victorious in the Civil War of 1863, sent an army to the frontier, proclaiming that their purpose was, quote, to liberate the brother Democrats of Ecuador from the theocratic yoke of Professor Moreno, end quote. His army was defeated in the Battle of Quasput, but he stood firm and his people showed no eagerness to accept Colombia's invitation to re-enter that confederacy. Her army was unable to follow up its advantage, and the danger quickly passed. When war broke out between Spain and Peru, he, like the Emperor of Brazil, refused to follow Chile's example and take sides against the mother country. In a word, his foreign policy was a selfish but intelligent opportunism, and he was not influenced by vague sentimental considerations and blind chauvinism. In 1864, Urbina, with the countenance and assistance of Peru, invaded the southern province Loja, but the insurrection was promptly crushed. Next year, Moreno's term expired, and he named a disciple and friend to be president in his place but his own political preponderance was so unquestioned, and his prestige so enormous in the barracks, convents, and pulperias, that he continued the real ruler of the country. His understudy did not please him, and he demanded and received a resignation. The incumbent next selected proved insubordinate, and had to be displaced by force. When Moreno declared himself provisional dictator, the Guayaquil liberals undertook an armed resistance, but by 1869 he was firmly in the saddle once more. He kept his hold on the government, apparently becoming more securely entrenched each year in the love and confidence of the soldiery, the priests, and the common people. From the safety of exile, the liberals wrote crushing pamphlets against him and his despotism, his favoritism towards the clergy, his steady relentless policy of conservatism and reaction, but their attempts at insurrection were feeble, and in 1875 he was re-elected as a matter of course. The liberals, hopeless of ending his domination constitutionally or by open war, had recourse to assassination. On the 6th of August, a party of young Creoles deliberately killed him at midday on the principal square of Quito in the presence of the populace and the soldiery. The murderers were executed and the vice-president succeeded to the vacancy. However, no one appeared big enough to fill Moreno's shoes, and his death made civil war inevitable. After a few months, the vice-president was deposed, then one of Moreno's ministers remained at the head of affairs for a short time, but finally Antonio Borrero was selected president in constitutional form. He proved not to possess the resolution requisite to cope with the situation, General Veintemilla, commander of the troops in Guayaquil, revolted in the name of the Liberal Party, defeated Borrero, and went through the usual form of summoning a convention, adopting a new constitution, and having himself named president. He held power insecurely and by the aid of a personal party from 1878 to 1883. But neither conservatives nor liberals were satisfied. The radicals attacked him furiously for not putting in practice anti-clerical principles, and the conservatives never trusted him. When his constitutional term expired, the army proclaimed him dictator, but he soon fell before the combined forces of his enemies. During the fighting, José Camano came to the front, and now seized the presidency. Alfaro, the principal liberal leader who had cooperated with Camano in overthrowing Veintemilla, made war against his late ally, but was defeated. The new president, once securely in his seat, formed close relations with the clergy and the old partisans of Moreno, and though the liberal chiefs kept up a guerrilla warfare in the forests and swamps, 
he finished out his term. In 1888 he was succeeded by Antonio Flores, who followed his predecessor's policy in the main, and was in his turn succeeded by another friend of Camanos, Luis Cordero. It was not until 1895 that the liberals were able to gather their forces for a formidable rebellion. Camano was then governor of Guayaquil, and the immediate occasion of the outbreak was the charge that he had taken part in the sale of the Chilean ironclad Esmeralda to Japan, then at war with China. It was claimed that Ecuador had acted as a go-between and committed a willful breach of the rules governing the conduct of neutral nations. President Cordero's prestige was seriously compromised by this incident. His forces were defeated in several actions, and he resigned. Alfaro, who had been in exile since 1883, returned, took possession of Guayaquil, was proclaimed dictator, and finally completely overthrew the conservatives in the Battle of Gatajo. His election to the presidency followed in 1897, and he was succeeded four years later by the president incumbent, General Leonidas Plaza. The Ecuador coast is one of the most fertile and lovely regions on the earth. It already furnishes a considerable proportion of those tropical products of which the great nations of the temperate zone demand more every year. Like a Luthon, which has been stranded at the foot of the Andes, its great shores refresh the eyes of the northbound traveller tired of the dreary desert that stretches from Valparaiso to the Gulf of Guayaquil. It possesses the best harbour on the Pacific south of Panama, and one of the few in all South America which is not mountain-locked. Between the Cordillera and the sea there is room for untold millions of cacao and coffee trees. In spite of civil war and political upheavals, which have made her custom-house so often the prey of irresponsible bandits masquerading under the name of dictators, Guayaquil's population and wealth have increased until she has outstripped the hoary old capital, which, enthroned on a volcano site, overlooks a narrow strip of cultivable land. Nevertheless, the plateau is still predominant in the Ecuadorian state, and supports a vast majority of the population. Nine-tenths of the inhabitants of the Andean region are Indians, mostly in a condition not far removed from bondage, by circumstance and their own distrustful natures shut up within the narrow limits of an existence which has no outlook over the mountains. Nonetheless, they are sturdy fellows, admirably suited to the climate of those high altitudes, and though their numbers have been practically stationary since the Spanish conquest, the failure to increase has been rather due to lack of room than to misgovernment, vice, or the want of the qualities that make for success in the struggle for existence. In that day, now near at hand, when a great railway shall connect the string of towns on the Ecuadorian plateau with Peru and Colombia, and when branches shall run to the ports and take the place of the well-nigh impassable trails down the tremendous rain-soaked slopes of the Andes, the mountain region of Ecuador may be transformed and revivified by new system of agriculture, and the artistic taste and remarkable ingenuity of the people may find a market and a reward. The railway from Guayaquil long stopped at the foot of the mountains, but within the last three years the almost insurmountable difficulties of the ascent have been overcome by American engineers, and the line is being rapidly built along the plateau to Quito. Ecuador already supplies the world with Panama hats, and other manual industries may flourish when unfavorable transportation conditions are removed. Not only are the common people patiently industrious, but they possess innate good taste and artistic feeling. Such a people has special aptitudes, sure to give it a place in that vastly complicated workshop into which the multifarious needs of modern civilization are transforming the earth. The plateau of Ecuador does not, however, offer room for any considerable immigration, and its wheat, barley, and potatoes do not and will not much more than suffice for local consumption. Ecuador's great future lies in the beautiful and as yet sparsely peopled Pacific Plain, and in the vast and absolutely unknown forests which stretch east from the Andes. End of section 22
Section 23 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 5. Venezuela. Chapter 1. Conquest, Settlement, and Colonial Days. On his third voyage, in 1498, Columbus sighted the Venezuelan coast just south of the Windward Islands. A year later, Alonso de Ojeda saw the mainland at about the same place, and skirted the coast for four hundred miles west, without finding any important break in a line of mountains which rose almost directly from the sea to a height of three to nine thousand feet, covered to their very tops with luxuriant vegetation. But there was no such barrier as that made by the main Andes on the Pacific. The passes were only half a mile instead of nearly three miles high. The slopes were not dry and desolate as in Peru, or covered with a tangled mass of forest as in Pacific Colombia and Ecuador. Just beyond the harbor where Puerto Cabello now stands, the coastline turned abruptly to the northwest, leaving the mountains further inland, but the intervening plain was swampy and uninviting. Still following west, Ojeda rounded Cape San Roman and turned south into the great gulf of Maracaibo. There he saw Indian villages of houses built on piles near the shallow shores, and he called the place Venezuela, Little Venice, a name shortly extended to the whole coast from the mouth of the Orinoco west to the forbidding and uninhabitable peninsula of Guajira, which forms the western promontory of the Gulf of Maracaibo. There is no record that either Columbus or Ojeda effected a permanent landing, and it was not until 1510 that some adventurers founded a settlement on the small island of Cubagua, in the channel between the large island of Margarita and the mainland. This was a mere nest of pirates who persecuted the Indians of the shore, kidnapping and selling them as slaves to the Spaniards on the Antilles, and it was shortly abandoned. In 1520, on the coast just opposite was founded the settlement of cumana the oldest city on the south american continent which though destroyed by the natives was rebuilt in fifteen twenty five when valuable pearl fisheries were discovered in the neighboring waters of margarita however the place remained of little importance and did not become a centre for the colonization of the adjacent country the spaniards attaching little value to this region because it contained no gold washings the real colonization of venezuela began four hundred miles farther west with the foundation in fifteen twenty seven of the city of coro on the narrow neck of land which separates the gulf of maracaibo from the caribbean sea thence there was easy access by water to the shores of the great lagoon or by land over the coast plain to the northwestern slopes of the andean range which runs southwest to the giant plateau of pamplona just over the colombian border the Andean valleys were filled with gold, and among the higher mountains lay fertile plateaus, cultivated by tribes of semi-civilized Indians. Altogether, the region was well calculated to stimulate the cupidity of adventurers. Charles V granted the Venezuela coast to the Welser family of Augsburg, the greatest merchants of their time, and his heavy creditors. Under their commission, the first Adelantaro, Alfinger, took possession of Coro, and conducted various expeditions southwest along the Andes, perishing near Pamplona about 1531. His successors continued these murdering, kidnapping incursions into the interior, often being led to their ruin among remote mountain fastnesses by tales of a mythical El Dorado, where the rivers ran over silver sands, the palaces were of solid gold, with doors and columns of diamonds and emeralds, and the Indian king every morning covered his body with gold dust and bathed in precious aromatic essences. Eighteen years, however, elapsed before the Spaniards established a permanent settlement in the interior, and only in 1545 was the city of Tocuyo founded in a beautiful Andean valley a hundred and fifty miles south of Coro. But the cruelties of the proprietor's agents scandalized public opinion. Charles V declared their concession cancelled, and a governor, responsible directly to the government, was appointed in 1547. Thenceforward, the settlement of Venezuela proceeded more rapidly. Five years later, the city of Barquisimiento, fifty miles north of Tocuyo, 
and near the point where the Andes join the coast range, was established on a secure footing after hard fighting with the Indians. In 1555 the Spaniards penetrated east a hundred miles along the lovely plateaus of the coast mountains and founded Valencia. The following year they settled Trujillo, fifty miles southwest of Tocuyo, and two years later Merida, a hundred miles farther in the same direction and not far from the Colombian frontier. To the east of Valencia lay valuable gold washings, and to work these the Spaniards fixed a camp at San Francisco in the Aragua Valley about 1560. This is the garden spot of Venezuela, and the warlike Teques Indians, under their terrible chief Guaycaipuro, massacred the miners and defeated several expeditions from Valencia and Barquisimiento. It was not until 1567 that the Spaniards succeeded in establishing their power in the valley of Caracas, which, a hundred miles east of Valencia, lies close to the shore, although 3,000 feet above sea level and separated from the ocean by high mountains. The defensibility of the site, as well as the fertility of the soil, pointed it out as the best place for the seat of government. A city was founded, which ten years later replaced Coro as the capital of the province, and shortly thereafter a port was opened at La Guaira, giving direct communication with Spain. The savage tribes fought more pertinaciously than the civilized natives of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and northern Chile and Argentina, and a greater number of Europeans and Negroes replaced those who were slain. Finally, however, the majority submitted and were incorporated as peasants into the Spanish system. By the end of the 16th century, the Spaniards had obtained undisputed possession of that lovely strip of mountainous country which extends from Cape Codera west between two parallel coast ranges to Barquisimiento and thence southwest nearly to the head of Lake Maracaibo, a belt some 400 miles long and 50 or 75 wide. They also held the great peninsula east of Maracaibo Gulf, and had established outlying settlements in the Llanos, south of the mountains, besides the two isolated ports, Cumana on the eastern coast and Maracaibo on the western. Notwithstanding the sack of Caracas in 1595 by the daring British buccaneer Amias Preston, the colony prospered. Unlike the Pacific coast, it had easy and direct communication with the Antilles and Europe, and altitude was great enough to ensure a healthful climate, while its fertile valleys could be reached from the sea in a few hours over easy passes, far different from those formidable gorges which are the only ways of reaching the table lands of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. The interior, instead of being a heavily forested plain like that of the Amazon, practically inaccessible behind tremendous rain-soaked declivities, was an open prairie into which the mountains sank gently and whose grassy expanses afforded pasture for immeasurable herds. These geographical and topographical features have been determinative of Venezuela's development and history, political as well as industrial. In the early years of the 17th century, the long-neglected Cumana district on the eastern coast began to be developed. The city of Barcelona was founded in 1617 near a magnificent body of grazing land, and in the best tobacco country in Venezuela, where the Indians had grown the plant for untold generations. Barcelona soon became an important center of population and the starting point for missionaries to the interior tribes. The gold placers which had attracted the first adventurers to the mountains west of Caracas became exhausted within a few decades. Nevertheless, the fertile lands distributed among the Spaniards in encomiendas continued to be cultivated by Indian and Negro labor, and although maize, bananas, potatoes, and in the higher valleys even wheat, as well as the vine and olive, with the cattle introduced by Europeans, furnished an abundant supply of food, to say nothing of tobacco and sugar, Spain's blind colonial policy virtually prevented export of agricultural products. The Spanish authorities wanted nothing from their American dominions but gold and silver, and when Venezuela's placers were exhausted, the colony was neglected. It was in spite of the prohibition of the Spanish government that cacao trees were introduced, and the exportation which soon grew up, the first of any importance from Venezuela, 
was mostly clandestine. Practically all the goods legally imported had to be procured from the Cadiz monopoly, and were sent to the Isthmus and there transshipped into coasting vessels, paying enormous freight charges, profits and duties. Tobacco and salt were monopolized by government concessionaries, and not a chicken could be sold in the markets without paying an exorbitant tax. Education was completely neglected. It was not until 1686 that a priest's school was established in Caracas, and when the city of Merida asked a similar boon, it was denied because, quote, His Catholic Majesty did not deem it wise that education should become general in America, end quote. So the Creoles grew up nearly as ignorant as the Indians around them, although retained all the fierce pride of their Spanish descent, acknowledging no man as superior, and retaining very dim sentiments of loyalty to the mother country. Nevertheless, the ancient municipal forms, traditional among peoples of Spanish descent, survived, furnishing the framework of civil government, while the priesthood continued a moral and intellectual tie binding the Creoles to their Castilian ancestors. The repressive regulations against commerce could not be perfectly enforced. Although the arrival of a ship from Spain was a real event, British, Dutch, and French traders frequented the coast, opening markets with their swords, and often turning buccaneers and sacking a town when not satisfied with their reception. But the burning of a few coast hamlets was more than compensated by the advantages of practical free trade, and Venezuela owed much of the prosperity she enjoyed during the 17th century to these semi-pirates. The settlements crept along the Andean valleys to the Colombian frontier. The Creoles ventured farther and farther into the wide plains of the Orinoco, and their cattle were soon roaming half-wild in the immense and luxuriant pastures stretching south of the agricultural strip. From the mixture of the Indians of the Llanos with Europeans sprang a new race of men, the semi-nomadic Llaneros, whose hardiness, courage, horsemanship, and prowess as hunters of big game have given them equal celebrity with the gauchos of the Argentine, the Cossacks of the Russian steppes, or the Texas cowboys. The buccaneers and smuggling traders were especially active in the latter part of the 17th century. In 1654 Frenchmen were repelled in an attack on Cumana, but in 1669 the Britisher, Morgan, sacked Maracaibo, and in 1679 the French pillaged Caracas itself. The paralysis suffered by Spain during the War of the Spanish Succession nearly destroyed Venezuelan commerce, and it did not recover with the Peace of Utrecht. Only five ships arrived in the first thirty years of the 18th century, and from 1706 to 1721 not a single vessel sailed for Spain. The Spanish government determined to try if another system would not bring a larger revenue into the royal treasury. The Guipuzcoa Company was granted an exclusive franchise to buy and sell in the colony, and the operations of this powerful corporation galvanized commerce into a certain activity. In order to stimulate the receipt of hides and prevent the incursions of wild plains Indians, trading posts were established in the Llanos, and soon the prairies south of Valencia and Caracas rivaled the Barcelona country in cattle, and the ranches extended up the Apure, the great western tributary of the Orinoco, to the foot of the Colombian Andes. Meanwhile, expeditions penetrated up the Orinoco from its mouth, and in 1764 the city of Angostura was established 400 miles from the sea. The operations of the Guipuzcoa Company did not aid in establishing a more friendly understanding between the home government and the Venezuelan Creoles. The independent merchants constantly quarrelled with the company's agents, the low prices for which they were compelled to sell their stock outraged the ranch owners. The farmers resented the monopolization of tobacco and the restrictions on sugar culture. Exorbitant prices were demanded for imported goods. Protests became so loud that special commissioners were sent from Spain to investigate, but they gave no satisfactory relief. Shortly after the foundation of the Guipuzcoa Company, Venezuela had been raised to the dignity of a captaincy general. The increased efficiency of the administration assisted the monopoly in suppressing clandestine trading, and the feeling grew to such a height 
that in 1749 a Creole leader named Leon menaced Caracas itself at the head of 6,000 armed men, demanding the suppression of the company and the expulsion of its factors. The captain-general was forced to yield, and the revolutionists dispersed, but his promise was never redeemed. The active measures of the company effectually shut off foreign trading ships, and the ports were so fortified that the British expeditions retired defeated from the attacks they made in 1739 and 1743 on La Guaira and Puerto Cabello, although in 1797 they captured the island of Trinidad and menaced the entrance to the Orinoco. It was not until 1778, when the Spanish government fully abandoned the monopolistic colonial system and opened all the ports of South America to free commerce with each other and with Spain, that the Guipuzcoa Company retired from business. Six years before this, the provinces of Maracaibo, Cumana, and Guiana, as the lower Orinoco region was called, all of which had heretofore been directly dependent upon the Viceroy of Bogotá, were placed under the jurisdiction of the Captain-General of Caracas, fixing the modern boundaries of Venezuela. End of section 23section twenty four of the south american republics volume two by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part five venezuela chapter two the revolt venezuela's conditions during colonial times produced a people possessing in the clearest and most accentuated form the characteristics distinctive of the spanish creole not more than one per cent of the total population of over eight hundred thousand were native spaniards fifteen per cent were creoles of pure european descent sixty per cent were indian two-thirds of whom had an admixture of white blood and three-fourths of the twenty-five per cent of negroes and mulattoes were free the majority did not consist of docile inert pure-bred natives as in ecuador peru bolivia and paraguay though the white element was not so large that the creoles had ceased to occupy the position of a government and property-owning caste who lived upon the labor of the half-breeds indians and negroes they regarded themselves as a superior class entitled by birth to exemption from manual labor and even considered commercial pursuits unworthy a gentleman the spanish government had concerned itself little with this purely agricultural colony and its hand was felt only in the collection of taxes the officials were comparatively few the number of resident spaniards small and neither mutual commercial interests nor a solid administration existed to strengthen the flimsy ties that bound venezuela to the mother country so little had the interference of the spanish government been felt since the abolishment of the guipuzcoa company that no well-defined and widespread sentiment in favor of separation existed there was a vague feeling of dissatisfaction among the masses but their ignorance prevented them from forming any rational plans for the betterment of their condition however the venezuelan coast is so accessible that the fertilizing and disturbing currents of trade and ideas had really profoundly modified the people and the leaven of unrest was at work the wealthier creoles had imbibed radical notions and were ambitious of trying their hands at governing by heredity social custom and environment indisposed to industry and commerce their unemployed activities naturally flowed into the channel of politics intrigue and fighting the first outbreak owed its origin to events in spain in seventeen ninety six a republican conspiracy was brought to light on the peninsula and several of its leaders were exiled to la guayra in their prison they were visited by many prominent creoles into whose minds they inculcated their republican principles and it was not long before the existence of an extensive republican plot among the creoles of la guayra and caracas was denounced to the captain-general many persons were arrested and of the two principals espana expiated his treason on the scaffold while the other gual escaped into exile but the seed of revolution had been planted and many leading creoles entered into correspondence with the british authorities on trinidad who promised aid and arms munitions and ships francisco miranda a native of caracas who had fought under washington 
and distinguished himself at Valmy and Remape as a soldier of the French Republic, planned an invasion with the avowed purpose of achieving Venezuelan separation from Spain. With three ships manned by American filibusters, he sailed from New York early in 1806 and attempted to land at Ocumare near Puerto Cabello. But the Spanish authorities had been warned, and he was beaten in a sea fight where he lost 60 prisoners. Ten North Americans were condemned by court-martial and shot in Puerto Cabello, and their names are inscribed on a monument recently erected in the principal square of the town. The captain-general offered $30,000 for Miranda's head, but the latter retired to Jamaica, where, with the help of the British authorities, he organized a force of 500 foreigners. Three months later he made a descent on Coro, effected a landing, and took the city. But the population remained inert, and the indifferent or hostile attitude of the region forced him to withdraw. Though the western provinces received Miranda so coldly, among the creoles of the upper classes at Caracas, aspirations for constitutional government, autonomy, and even for independence had made headway in the ten years since the suppression of the conspiracy of Gual and Espana. In 1808, French commissioners arrived, bringing the news of Ferdinand's expulsion. They were empowered to receive the allegiance of the colony for Joseph Bonaparte, but the captain-general hesitated and asked the advice of leading citizens, who proved unanimous against recognizing the French regime. The captain-general's vacillation gave the creoles of the Cabildo a predominance in governmental councils. Although in the middle of the following year it was decided to recognize the Seville Junta as supreme, pending Ferdinand's return, this decision was reached only after many debates, and a numerous party among the creoles saw no reason why Venezuela should not establish a junta of her own. The news of the frightful cruelties perpetrated by Goyenche in suppressing the junta at La Paz excited great indignation among Creoles. The anti-Spanish feeling grew rapidly, and when, on the 19th of April, 1810, the captain-general summoned an open cabildo to receive the news that the French armies had overrun nearly the whole of Spain, and that only Cadiz remained faithful to Ferdinand, the electors had no sooner met then, excited by suggestions of ambitious persons, they turned into a mob howling for the resignation of the captain-general and the establishment of a Caracas junta. Accordingly, a junta was named, which exiled the Spanish functionaries and sent messages to the provincial capitals, demanding their adhesion. The cities of the mountain strip extending from Cumana to the Colombian Andes responded favorably and sent delegates to Caracas while Maracaibo, Coro, and Guiana refused. As a matter of fact, the masses as yet took little interest. The Caracas Revolution was effected by a few determined spirits, and the adhesion of the mountain provinces was given by Creole municipal authorities, who saw in the change an opportunity to better their personal fortunes. Nor was the resistance of Coro and Maracaibo so much inspired by love of Spain as by the presence of the resolute, clear-headed José Ceballos, who gathered troops and sent emissaries into the revolted provinces. The Caracas Junta responded by raising an army which marched towards Coro, and the civil war was on. The news of the massacre of the Ecuadorian revolutionists at Quito in August 1810 warned the Junta Creoles that they had engaged in no child's play. A commission went to London to solicit the intervention of the British government in reaching an accommodation with the Patriot authorities in Spain, but the Seville Junta declared the Caracas revolutionists traitors. The commissioners fell under Miranda's influence, and he convinced them that an open declaration of independence was the only course left. Meanwhile, the troops sent to conquer Coro had been defeated by Ceballos, threatened by the royalist arms, unable to count on the support of any considerable proportion of the rural population of even their own provinces the creoles of the ruling coterie proceeded to extreme measures a congress met in march and on the fifth of july eighteen eleven adopted a declaration of independence proclaiming the seven provinces of cumana barcelona caracas barinas trujillo merida and margarita free and sovereign states Venezuela was, therefore, the first independent republic in Spanish America. 
Congress adopted a constitution full of the most radical reforms and advanced ideas, and a handful of political theorists and advanced radicals took the direction of affairs and imposed their crude theories on a bewildered and reluctant population. The ruling clique issued fiat money in immense quantities, and the resulting disorganization of business increased discontent. Miranda, who had come from Europe to take a command of military operations, warned them that the fabric was not strong enough to withstand the shock of battle, but the eager young reformers persisted. The clergy and the native Spaniards were the first to react. Though an outbreak of the Spaniards in Caracas was bloodily suppressed, the priests stirred up the people of Valencia, and that city, the second in the Republic, declared against the Caracas government. Miranda succeeded in reducing the place only after costly fighting. The ruling clique did what they could to raise and equip troops to meet the approaching attack from Coro and the West Indies, but their efforts were hampered by a loyalist risings. In February 1812, Monteverde, a Spanish leader, marched with a small detachment south from Coro, and northern Trujillo welcomed him. Defeating the Patriot forces wherever he met them, and refusing quarter to his prisoners, he prepared to advance eastward on the centre of the revolution. The junta was already trembling, when, on the 26th of March, a terrific earthquake devastated the revolted provinces. The solid ground rocked with such violent oscillations that in less than a minute the cities of Caracas, Barquisimeto, and Merida were mere heaps of ruins. 12,000 persons perished in Caracas alone. The loyalist provinces escaped injury, and the priests preached that the earthquake was a punishment sent by God upon impious rebellion. The people of Barquisimeto joined Monteverde, and he marched east, slaughtering the raw recruits with which the patriot leaders tried to block his way. Merida, Trujillo, and Barinas declared for the king, and an expedition sent from Caracas to the lower Orinoco was destroyed. Monteverde entered Valencia unopposed, and only the coast from Caracas east to Cumaná remained to the Republic. In despair the politicians made Miranda dictator, but though the army numbered five thousand, he had no confidence in his men. He signed a capitulation, and tried to fly while his army dispersed or joined the loyalist forces. On the 30th of July Monteverde entered Caracas, and the first Venezuelan revolution ceased to exist. Among the volunteer officers who had been entrusted with positions of confidence by Miranda was a young Creole named Simon Bolivar. Heir to some of the largest estates in Venezuela, he had been left an orphan at three years of age, and was educated by a tutor who filled his marvelously impressible mind with a crude political philosophy, and under whose teachings he evolved original theories of government which all the wars, debates, and revolutions of his stormy life failed to modify. Preoccupied with his own ideas, he gave no heed to the counsels of others, took no thought of obstacles, and, victor or vanquished, stubbornly followed his own way, always confident of infallibility, and persevering in the face of difficulties that would have appalled a rational man. From the earliest childhood a little feudal lord, owing obedience to no parent with hundreds of slaves at his orders his precocious intelligence the object of that ruinous admiration with which thoughtless strangers and servants spoil a rich and lonely child his naturally strong will uncurbed by any discipline he grew into manhood arrogant uncompromising solitary suspicious a deep thinker wildly ambitious marvellously brilliant though lacking steady common sense blindly confident of his own moral and intellectual infallibility, firmly convinced that he was destined for vague great things, inordinately fond of honours and praise, and absolutely unable to distinguish his desires of gratifying selfish ambitions and his yeasty notions of regenerating mankind. At sixteen he went to Spain to complete his education. His wealth procured him an entrance into the aristocratic families of Madrid, and he even penetrated the precincts of the ceremonious court, and had the honour of playing ball with the lad who afterwards became Ferdinand the Seventh. When only eighteen he married a beautiful girl, who died shortly after he brought her back to Caracas. For the rest of his life he remained without family ties. 
Again he went to Europe and wandered through England, France, and Italy, falling more and more under the spell of the mighty spirit of Napoleon the Great. At the age of twenty-three, Bolivar returned to his native country and took up his life as a rich slave owner. When the revolution broke out in 1810, he took no part until the junta requested him to go to England on the embassy previously mentioned. There he became acquainted with Miranda, and appreciating that the South American revolution must be decided by arms, made up his mind that only as a soldier could he put himself at the head of affairs in Venezuela. His first essays into the military art were not successful, and it was he who lost Puerto Cabello, giving the first revolution its coup de grace. But a situation in which others saw no hope he regarded as an opportunity, and resolved to devote his life to South American independence. Bolivar went to Cartagena in Colombia, and offered his sword to the patriot junta which ruled that city. Given a small military command on the Magdalena River, he embodied a few militia and surprised two posts which were obstructing the navigation of the river. Delighted at these successes, the Cartagena junta sent him reinforcements with which he captured Ocana, an important city lying east of the Magdalena and not far from Pamplona and the Venezuelan border. The loyalists had collected a considerable force in the Venezuelan province of Barinas, with which they proposed to advance into Pamplona. The patriot chief of this Colombian province appealed to Bolivar, and this suggested to him the Napoleonic plan of relieving Pamplona and reconquering Venezuela. On his own responsibility, he dashed with only 400 men over the Andes in front of Ocana, descended into the plain north of Lake Paracaibo, took the royalists on their march to Pamplona by surprise, and routed them. Joined by the patriots from Pamplona, he received formal authorization to drive the Spaniards from the Venezuelan provinces of Merida and Trujillo. His movements among the mountain valleys were like lightning flashes, and though the Spanish forces were more numerous, their commanders were demoralized by his attacks, made in defiance of all the rules of prudent warfare. Within fifty days there was not an enemy left in two provinces, and Bolivar's army had been trebled by enlistments. The new Granadan government ordered him to pause, but he paid no heed. Issuing a proclamation that no quarter would be given, he crossed the mountains southwest into the province of Barinas, annihilated the Spanish forces there, and rushing to the east, caught another army of a thousand men near Valencia and destroyed it. Monteverde had no time to concentrate his scattered forces, and the news of this last defeat caused him to flee to the protection of the fortifications of Puerto Cabello. Bolivar occupied Valencia and Caracas without resistance. In a campaign of ninety days, with a handful of new Granadans and mountaineers from western Venezuela, he had defeated and dispersed over four thousand royalists, and conquered the country from the Andes to the capital. Only the lower plains of the Orinoco and the coast provinces of Maracaibo and Coro remained royalist, for while Bolivar had been overrunning the west, another young creole, Marino, had led a small expedition from the island of Margarita, captured Maturin just east of the mouth of the Orinoco, and with the military stores found there, armed the inhabitants of Cumana province, made ripe for revolts by the cruelties of Monteverde. The Spanish attempts to recover Maturin by assault were repulsed with great slaughter, and Marino followed up his success by besieging Cumana. By the time Bolivar reached Caracas, the place was in the last extremities of starvation, and Monteverde's flight was a signal for its surrender. There were therefore two dictators in Venezuela, and Marino sent to Bolivar to treat about the form of government, but the latter had determined on a centralized administration with himself supreme. Marino refused to agree, and only the activity of the loyalists prevented a war between him and Bolivar. Monteverde held out in Puerto Cabello, but when reinforcements arrived from Spain, resumed the offensive. Though Bolivar won a victory at Las Trincheras, and was greeted on his return to Caracas with the title of Liberator, reaction had in fact begun. Reports of loyalist movements came from all sides. Bolivar's power was confined to the towns. The terrible Boves roused the Llaneros and gathered the nucleus of a formidable army of horsemen. 
Ceballos sailed out from Coro and captured Barquisimeto, utterly defeating Bolivar when the latter attacked him. Difficulties, however, only stimulated this remarkable man to fresh exertions. The Patriot leader, Campo Elias, overthrew Boves's horsemen near Calabozo on the Llanos south of Caracas, killing the prisoners and butchering every man in the town because it had helped the loyalists. This cruel deed decided the Llaneros for the Spanish side, and though Bolivar, with the assistance of Campo Elias's troops, won the pitched battle of Araure from Ceballos, Boves had escaped to the plains there to recruit another army of Llaneros, which was destined to expel the liberator. Bolivar was soon reduced to the possession of Caracas and its neighboring valleys, with a feeble reserve at Valencia. Mariño had 3,500 men, and Bolivar finally agreed to recognize him as dictator of the eastern provinces as the price of his help. But their union only put off the evil day. Boves crushed Campo Elias at La Puerta and advanced on Caracas. Raging like a trapped wild beast, Bolivar ordered the wholesale assassination of 866 Spaniards confined at La Guaira. His desperation inspired his followers, and when Boves attacked the entrenchments outside Caracas and rushed the Patriot magazine, the young Granadan who was in command, seeing that the place could not be held, ordered his men to fly, but when the loyalists triumphantly rushed into the building, they found him in the act of throwing a match into the powder. In the explosion, eight hundred of the assaulting column were blown into the air, and the survivors desisted. Mariño was coming by forced marches from the east along the plains, and Boves retired to cut him off, while Ceballos also abandoned the siege of Valencia. Mariño eluded Boves and beat off one attack. If the liberator had concentrated his forces and united with his colleague, the patriots would have stood a chance, but he sent most of his own troops to recover the west, joining Mariño with only a few men. At La Puerta, on the 14th of June, 1814, the battle decisive of the Second Venezuelan Revolution was fought. The desperate charges of Boves's Llanero horsemen overwhelmed the patriots, and more than half their numbers were left dead on the field. Bolivar fled to Caracas, gathered all the money and jewels, and encumbered by a great multitude of fugitives, retreated east. But at Aragua, the patriots were driven out of their trenches with terrific slaughter. The liberator took ship at Barcelona with the intention of making a last stand near the mouth of the Orinoco, but his comrades had had enough of him. He was declared a traitor, and Rivas put in command. The remaining patriots managed to repulse one attack of the royalists, but in a second they were defeated, and in a third Boves slaughtered them nearly to the last man, although he himself was killed in the melee. Only a few scattered bands on the plateaus of Barcelona and the plains of the upper Orinoco kept up a resistance. The detachment which Bolivar had so imprudently sent west before the battle of La Puerta escaped into New Granada, while the liberator went by sea to that country and took service under its government. The revolution headed by Bolivar and Mariño had been crushed by Boves, Morales and Ceballos with troops recruited in Venezuela itself. Monteverde's defeat and Boves's death left Morales master of Venezuela and virtually independent of outside control. But by 1815, Ferdinand was securely on the throne of Spain, and absolutism had replaced the constitution established by the popular leaders of 1812. The Spanish government determined to suppress the revolutionists, who still maintained themselves in New Granada and the Argentine, and to reduce the semi-independent royalist chiefs to a more exact obedience. In April, Morillo, Spain's ablest general, arrived near Cumana at the head of 10,000 veteran regulars. Morales sailed out to meet the marshal and place his troops at his orders, but the regular officers gazed in astonishment at the dark-skinned Llaneros, wearing only a hat and a waistcloth, who were the pillars of royal authority in Venezuela. At first the Spaniards accepted the aid of these half-savage allies, but Morillo lost no time in establishing a military despotism in which the Llanero chiefs had no place. Even more unpopular was his leaving 3,000 Spaniards to garrison Venezuela, while he impressed an equal number of native troops to accompany him on his expedition against New Granada. 
nearly a third of the latter deserted rather than embark, and the attitude of the Spanish officers who were left behind to rule the country roused the native instinct for independence. Meanwhile the scattered bands of Patriot guerillas on the western headwaters of the Orinoco, near the Granadan border, had been uniting and increasing in strength. José Antonio Paez, a mixed blood, only twenty-six years old, who could neither read nor write, but of Herculean strength and skill in the use of lance and sword, proved the leader for the occasion. A small corps in which he was a simple captain was threatened by the Spanish governor of Barinas at the head of fourteen hundred men. His own commander wished to retreat, but Paez persuaded five hundred reckless fellows to follow him in a night assault. Leading his men in a furious charge, he bore down the enemy with a rush, killing four hundred and taking many prisoners whom he treated so well that they all joined him. The fame of his success spread through the Llanos, and the rough plainsmen, dissatisfied with the discipline and routine of the regular Spanish officers, flocked to the banner of this new chieftain, and he began the organization of the army of the Apure, destined to be the principal instrument in the redemption of Venezuela. Meanwhile, the guerilla chiefs further down the Orinoco made headway against the Spaniards, and the whole plain turned to the patriot side. Hearing of these successes, Bolivar resolved to return to Venezuela. He landed near the mouth of the Orinoco, but was soon driven thence and took ship for Ocumare, near Puerto Cabello. From this point he sent a small expedition inland towards Valencia under the command of MacGregor, who achieved some successes against isolated bodies of loyalists, was joined by many llaneros, and finally made his way to the plains of Barcelona, while Bolivar was compelled to re-embark and flee to Haiti. MacGregor took the city of Barcelona, and then, with the assistance of the Negro chief Piar, who had been besieging Cumana, repulsed Morales himself at the Battle of Juncal. By the end of 1816, the Patriots had gained so many advantages that Morillo thought himself obliged to return to Venezuela at the head of huge reinforcements. However, the Patriot cause needed a head. The chieftains were rude and ignorant men with a talent for fighting and nothing more, while Bolivar was a man of wide and varied accomplishments. In spite of his failures, he retained great prestige among the Creole officers. He was agreed upon as general-in-chief, and in December landed at Barcelona. But Piar had led his victorious army over to the Orinoco, and notwithstanding Bolivar's entreaties, the Llaneros persisted in their refusal to return to a country where cavalry could not manoeuvre to advantage. When Bolivar arrived at Piar's headquarters near Angostura, he appreciated that the true theatre for a successful war had been found. In those plains the Llanero cavalry, which formed the bulk of the Patriot force, was invincible. Morillo also realized that the coast would not long remain tenable if the line of the Orinoco were in the hands of the Patriots, and he sent a regular force of 3,000 men under La Torre down the Apure and Orinoco to Angostura, while he himself quickly made an end of the few insurrectionists who stubbornly refused to retire from the coast to the Llanos. During one of Bolivar's absences, La Torre offered Piar battle, and at San Felix, in April 1817, the plainsmen annihilated the Spanish infantry. Bolivar now went vigorously to work to secure complete command of the river and soon had quite a fleet. His ascendancy over the officers increased daily, and when Piar conspired against him, he was strong enough to have the Negro hero arrested and shot as a traitor. Before the end of 1817, the Patriots were in command of the whole line of the rivers, except the fortress of San Fernando, near the junction of the Apure and Orinoco, and Morillo could do nothing against them because the plains were flooded. When the waters fell in early spring, the Royalists achieved some successes, but Bolivar joined Paez, established a blockade of San Fernando, and surprised Morillo himself near Calabozo. Against Paez's advice, he now insisted on making a campaign for the recovery of Caracas, but was badly defeated by the marshal at La Puerta, a spot for the third time the scene of a patriot downfall. Though Paez had captured San Fernando, 
his expedition into the mountain country was no more successful than Bolívar's, and the two retreated to the river to raise fresh troops. Morales followed the Patriots to the Apure, but was in his turn repulsed by Paez, giving Bolívar a breathing spell. The Liberator's position was desperate. His infantry had been destroyed, his cavalry reduced in numbers, his men were nearly without arms, his ammunition exhausted. Ill-considered manoeuvres had turned the brilliant situation in which he had found Patriot affairs a year before into the gloomiest sort of an outlook. On the other hand, a defensive campaign in the Llanos could be kept up indefinitely, and though Morillo had 12,000 men in the populous mountain provinces north of the plains, he also was without money, arms, and supplies. As he reported to the Peruvian viceroy, quote, Twelve pitched battles, in which the best officers and troops of the enemy have fallen, have not lowered their pride or lessened the vigor of their attacks. End quote. With that indomitable energy, which more than compensated for his inferiority as a strategist, Bolivar set to work to create a new army. Cavalry of the most admirable sort could be recruited in sufficient number amongst the Llaneros, but bitter experience had convinced him that against Spanish regulars the native infantry stood little chance. The cessation of the Napoleonic Wars had left thousands of European veterans without employment, and Bolivar contracted for a few thousand Britishers and Irishmen, paying a bounty of eighty dollars per man on enlistment, and promising five hundred dollars at the conclusion of the war. Some of these troops arrived opportunely late in 1818, and few as their numbers were, no soldiers in South America could stand against them. In October, Bolivar issued a proclamation foreshadowing the union of Venezuela and New Granada, in the midst of defeat, with all of both countries, except the thinly populated Orinoco plains, in possession of the Spaniards, he was confidently planning the creation of a great empire. Morillo opened the campaign of 1819 by advancing with over 6,000 men against Paez on the upper Orinoco. The Creoles 4,000 were mostly cavalry, and he had learned better than to risk a pitched battle. The Spanish columns were harassed beyond endurance by his light horsemen, and after weeks of heart-breaking marches, Morillo had to retire, having accomplished nothing. From Bolivar's erratic genius now emanated a great stroke of strategy. West of the plains of the Apure and Casanare, tributaries of the Upper Orinoco, rises the giant range of the Cordillera, and on its top lay the fertile plateaus of Socorro, Tunja, and Bogotá, the populous heart of New Granada. For three years the Spaniards had been in secure possession, and all except 3,000 troops had been drafted for service in Venezuela and Peru. A small Spanish force came down from Tunja to attack the Patriot guerillas in Casanare, and was repulsed. Where the enemy could go, he could follow, reasoned Bolivar. Paez's cavalry had proved itself amply able to hold the Llanos, so no risk to Venezuela would be incurred by temporarily withdrawing part of the infantry. With 2,000 natives and 500 British, the Liberator followed up the Orinoco, Meta, and Casanare to the latter's source at the foot of the Paya Pass, which leads directly into the fertile valley of Sagamoso, the heart of Tunja province. This pass is high and very difficult, although the distance to be traversed was only 80 miles. The road was a mere track leading along precipices, crossing and recrossing mountain torrents, and the rain fell incessantly as the patriots struggled up the slippery path. When they reached the higher regions, a hundred men perished with the cold, and not a horse survived. The army arrived at Sagamoso in a pitiable condition, but without seeing an enemy except an outpost, which was easily dislodged. Not knowing Bolivar's numbers, Barreiro, the Spanish commander, dared not attack, and the Liberator thus obtained a much-needed opportunity to rest his men and gather horses for his dismounted cavalry. As soon as he got his army in hand, he outmaneuvered Barreiro, and by a rapid march captured the city of Tunja, where he found a good store of arms and material. This movement also placed the Patriot army between the Spaniards and Bogotá. Barreiro, seeing himself cut off from his base, made a desperate dash for the capital, 
but Bolívar knew the enemy's route and took up a position directly across his path on the right bank of the small river Boyacá. Though the Patriots were only slightly superior in numbers, the Spaniards had to attack at a disadvantage and fled completely defeated after losing a hundred men. Practically their whole force was dispersed or made prisoners. Small as were the numbers engaged, and easily as it was won, Boyacá was the most important battle fought in northern Spanish America. Central New Granada, the wealthiest and most populous part of the country, fell into Bolívar's hands without a further blow. Its revenues relieved his financial difficulties, and among its sturdy inhabitants he recruited a new army. Morillo, now isolated in Venezuela, must expect an attack from the Llaneros, reinforced by the Granadan mountaineers. During the Liberator's absence from Venezuela, he had been branded as a traitor for abandoning his country without the authorization of Congress, and Mariño made commander-in-chief. But the news of Boyacá fell like a thunderbolt among the disaffected, and his return in December quelled them utterly. No opposition was made when he announced that Venezuela and New Granada were united into a single republic, the United States of Colombia, with himself as president and military dictator. The year 1820 passed without any decisive campaign. Bolivar occupied himself principally in recruiting and refitting his armies. Twelve hundred Irish mercenaries arrived and were incorporated with an army which was sent by sea to threaten the Spaniards in Cartagena and cooperate with the New Granadans on the lower Magdalena. A strong division of Venezuelans was sent against Quito. Paez, with the main army of the Apure, was, however, repulsed in an advance into Barinas. In spite of this success, Morillo could only lie inactive south of Caracas. His forces were not numerous enough both to retake New Granada and to hold northern Venezuela. But word came that Ferdinand was preparing an army of 20,000 men which would shortly sail from Cadiz for America, and with this reinforcement the marshal believed he could destroy all the patriot armies. The revolution which broke out in Spain in 1820 against Ferdinand's absolute government overturned his hopes. The expedition never sailed, and the new liberal government showed itself disposed to make terms with the revolted colonies. In November, a six-month armistice was arranged, pending the dispatch of peace commissioners to the mother country, and Morillo resigned in favor of La Torre. Bolivar's lieutenants respected the armistice only when convenient, and shamelessly continued warlike operations, wresting the new Granadan coast from the Spaniards, beginning the siege of Cartagena, and encouraging a revolt in the province of Maracaibo. When La Torre declared the armistice at the end, Late in April 1822, Bolivar had 20,000 men in the field, disposed in five armies. Montilla was besieging Cartagena with 3,000, one Granadan army held the valley of the Magdalena, another was operating against Ecuador, Bermudez with 2,000 men threatened Caracas from the east, and Bolivar and Paez, at the head of 9,000 men, were ready to advance directly from the Orinoco on Valencia and Caracas. To these forces La Torre could only oppose 9,000 troops besides his garrisons. The moment the armistice was formally terminated, Bolivar started straight for La Torre. The latter had made the fatal mistake of dividing his forces, and had only about 3,000 men drawn up on the wild plain of Carabobo, at the northern foot of the passes which lead through the mountains from the Llanos to the Valencia Plateau. Bolivar's 6,000 captured the passes, but he could not deploy his infantry on the flat ground in front except at the risk of having them cut to pieces. On June 23, 1821, he detached the British Legion of 1,000 men and 1,500 cavalry under Paez around to the left to take the Spaniards in flank. The charge of the Llanero horse was driven back by the musket fire, but the pursuing Spaniards were checked by the steady Englishmen who stood in their tracks and withstood the fire of the whole Spanish army. Their ammunition was soon exhausted. No help came from Bolivar. All seemed to be over with them. A second cavalry charge was as unsuccessful as the first, and the surviving Britishers made up their minds to carry the enemy's position or perish. Their commander had fallen. The colors changed bearers seven times. 
still they kept their formation as steadily as if on parade, and bayonet in hand rushed on the Spaniards, who outnumbered them four to one. For a brief time the struggle was fierce, and the result doubtful, but cold steel in the hands of such a desperate, forlorn hope was too much for the Spaniards. They began to give ground, and at last broke and fled. The Llanero horse rode them down, and only a remnant escaped to the shelter of Puerto Cabello. Bolivar entered Caracas acclaimed, and this time justly, as the liberator of his country. Meanwhile, the Constituent Congress of the New Republic of Colombia had met at Cucuta, a town near the limits of Venezuela and New Granada. It was composed entirely of civilians and lawyers, and proved to be radically republican and opposed to Bolivar's anti-democratic theories. Though a centralized government was adopted, Congress rejected the life presidency and hereditary senate, and abolished the military dictatorship by providing that the commander-in-chief, when on active service, should leave his political functions in the hands of the vice-president. Bolivar made a pretense of declining the presidency, but yielded to the importunities of Congress, and continued in command of the army on the terms proposed, stipulating, however, that he be allowed to organize as he saw fit the provinces he might conquer in the rest of South America. The Spaniards now held only Puerto Cabello and Cumana, but no progress was made toward driving them out of these positions during the remainder of 1821, nor until after Bolivar had, early in 1822, left for the south to cooperate with Sucre in the conquest of Quito. In October, Cumana surrendered to Bermudez, but from Puerto Cabello, Morales led an expedition which reconquered Maracaibo and Coro. He was unable to hold them, and the defeat of his squadron on Lake Maracaibo in July 1823 forced him to surrender. On the 8th of November, Puerto Cabello was taken by assault, and the long war for Venezuela's independence was over. End of section 24《セクション25 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 5. Venezuela. Chapter 3. Modern Venezuela. In 1822, Bolivar departed, bent on the conquest of Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, leaving a new Granadan vice president as ruler of the great Colombian Republic, of which Venezuela was merely one division. The massacres and sackings of ten bloody years had depopulated and impoverished Venezuela, and the cost of maintaining the army and aiding Bolivar in his foreign contests drained its exhausted resources. The educated Creoles, especially powerful in the agricultural regions near the coast, saw no place for themselves in Bolivar's centralizing system. They wanted to control the offices in their own localities, and did not relish the establishment of a bureaucracy in which appointments and promotions would be settled at Bogotá. The predominant radical French ideas added force to the sentiment of local independence. The theorists were offended by Bolivar's manifest predilection toward aristocratic forms and the favors which he granted the clergy. Most dangerous of all, jealousy of the liberator was rife among the generals. Paez had indeed been left at the head of military affairs in Venezuela, and soon after the capture of Puerto Cabello, he became involved in quarrels with the municipal authorities. The Llanero general wrecked little of the arguments of the lawyers, and carried things with a high hand. In 1826, when the Bogota government sent an order for the organization of militia, he filled the measure to overflowing, and the municipality of Caracas made a formal complaint to the central government. A decree for his suspension was issued, but a riot in the streets terrorized the cabildo, and he was replaced in power as a sort of dictator. This amounted to a destruction of the influence of the central Colombian government in Venezuelan affairs. Many cities raised the standard of rebellion and made themselves virtually independent. Bolivar hastened back from Peru to reduce his old companion in arms to obedience. He cajoled Paez into temporary cooperation, subdued most of the revolted cities, and, seeing that his system could not be sustained without coercion, assumed a dictatorship. But the news that Peru had revolted 
destroyed his dream of a continent-wide dominion and the demand for local autonomy continued so strong throughout venezuela and new granada that he was forced to call a national assembly to amend the constitution on the basis of a compromise in spite of bolivar's intrigues nearly half the elected delegates stayed away and a majority of those who presented themselves at Ocana in March 1828, though chosen under the pressure of his influence, opposed his measures. The minority who favoured him withdrew at his suggestion, leaving the Congress without a quorum. It dissolved, and the Liberator visited Caracas, Cartagena, and Bogotá, calling people assemblies whose deliberations were directed by bayonets, and which obediently besought him to save the country from anarchy in his own way. He issued a decree virtually abolishing the Cucuta constitution, but a conspiracy to assassinate him was formed at Bogotá in the fall of 1828, and he was saved only by the devotion of his mistress, who stood in the way of the midnight assassins, giving him time to jump from a window and escape. He took a fearful vengeance on the conspirators and banished his worst political enemies but the incident failed to turn public sentiment in his favour and it was in vain that he exhibited himself as a martyr his old friend general cordoba headed an unsuccessful insurrection in the province of antioquia insurgents rose in popayan and rio negro and towards the end of eighteen twenty nine in bolivar's native city caracas an assembly of one thousand generals public functionaries and prominent citizens announced that venezuela would shortly separate from colombia and called upon paez to assume a dictatorship the liberator struggled vainly against the rising tide of federalism the country was at heart opposed to caesarism and union he had been unable to convince the creoles of the advisability of providing a strong centralized government and his only supporters were personal ones bitterly protesting that he was falsely charged with aspiring to mount a throne and insisting that his real ambition had been only to secure the perpetuity of the colombian union and establish an ordered government he offered his resignation congress however contained many of his friends and hesitated at coming to an open breach he was re-elected and made one last effort to enforce the obedience of venezuela but the troops he raised in new granada did not dare to attack paez who with superior force was waiting in an impregnable position near the frontier sick and discouraged the liberator renewed his resignation this time in earnest and retired to the sea-coast where a few months later he died of a wasting sickness at the early age of forty-seven though his courage energy and sublime persistence and self-confidence had been the chief factors in securing south american independence those qualities proved utterly inadequate to hold in check the unruly ambitions of the creoles he died clearly foreseeing the decades of anarchy which lay before the northern countries of the continent Quote, i blush to admit it he said to congress on the eve of his fall but independence is the only benefit we have achieved, and that has been at the cost of all others. End quote. On his deathbed he wrote, quote, Our constitutions are books, our laws papers, our elections combats, and life itself is a torment. We shall arrive at such a state that no foreign nation will condescend to conquer us, and we shall be governed by petty tyrants. End quote the venezuelan federalists had not waited for bolivar's death to complete the formal separation from colombia in may eighteen thirty a constituent congress assembled which named paez dictator and notified bogota that the country regarded itself as absolutely independent but bolivar had partisans and the ruling clique enemies the eastern provinces refused to recognize paez's authority and the whole country was soon under arms but bolivar's death and the virtual recognition of venezuela's independence by new granada brought about a treaty between paez and monagas the chief of the insurrection the creole aristocracy came to a working understanding with the generals and little cliques in each city supported the central government as long as they were recognized as dominant in their own localities naturally the ignored outsiders were dissatisfied and plotted to overthrow these oligarchies 
In May, 1831, a revolution broke out in Caracas, which menaced nothing less than the extermination of the property holding classes, but it was suppressed and its leaders executed. On paper, the form of government was most liberal, Congress abolishing the tobacco monopoly and many odious taxes inherited from Spanish times, proclaiming religious freedom and adopting a constitution very similar to that of the United States. But in practice, the conservative cliques had things their own way. Though ambitious chiefs headed insurrections from time to time, they were all bought off or defeated, and Paez continued president until 1835, leaving the country in a condition of comparative order and prosperity. Dr. Vargas, a civilian, succeeded him, but against him the generals revolted, declaring Mariño dictator. Carujo, the soul of the insurrection, said, in the act of making the president and his ministers prisoners, quote, Dr. Vargas, the world belongs to the strongest, end quote, and the latter nobly replied, No, the world belongs to the just, end quote, resuming, in a word, the conflict between force and law, between unbridled ambition and the necessity for order, which has desolated Venezuela to this day, and which will last until the selfish elements learn that their own true interests would best be served by promoting the prosperity of the whole people, by relying upon their own industry rather than on the chance to despoil the producing classes. The government party appealed to Paez, and the Llanero general accepted the command. His prestige with the common people and the army enabled him to gather forces with which he overcame the revolted generals after eight months of bloody civil war. Vargas was recalled from exile, but after a short time refused to continue in the presidency, and his place was taken by the vice-president, Dr. Narvarte. In 1839, Paez was again made president, and was succeeded in 1842 by General Sublet, another of the heroes of the War of Independence. Until 1846, there was comparative tranquility in Venezuela. The population had decreased by a fifth during the Spanish Wars, being estimated at 650,000 in 1825, but within the succeeding 20 years it grew to a million and a quarter. Cacao? coffee and sugar became important articles of export and made the landed proprietors rich. With the cessation of warlike operations on the plains, cattle rapidly multiplied, the first wagon roads were built, and a bank was established. In 1846 an anti-creole insurrection broke out among the men of color, and Paez was again invested with dictatorial powers. When he had completed his work, he installed Monagas as president. Popular irritation against the ruling conservative coterie was, however, profound, and Monagas quarrelled with the Congress and sent his soldiers to break up its meetings. Paez took up arms again and tried to expel his nominee, but was defeated, and for the next nine years Monagas and his brother alternated in the presidency. Though raised to power by the conservative party, they abandoned it, and before 1850 had thrown themselves into the arms of the liberals or federalists. Extravagant powers were granted to the states. The provincial coteries ran their localities to suit themselves. The ties binding the different parts of the country together were weakened. An elaborate and confused set of taxes, national, provincial, and municipal, well nigh choked commerce out of existence. More and more liberty was conceded to the states and municipalities, and, on paper, to the individual also. Slavery was abolished in 1854. Revolutions broke out from time to time, and finally, in 1858, the so-called conservatives overthrew the Monagas regime. But they immediately divided into warring groups, and their new constitution proved too centralizing to suit the Creole politicians. The liberals hoisted the banner of federalism, and several provinces rose in revolt. Under the leadership of Pedro Gual, the conservatives were, however, victorious, but they again split to pieces, and Gual himself went over to the liberals. A revolution in Caracas brought back old General Paez, who assumed a dictatorship and tried to re-establish the power of the central government. But it was impossible. Many disappointed conservatives had turned federalist. 
no politician seemed willing to submit to any administration unless he was a member of it. The struggle had degenerated into a mere selfish contest for power, and the terms liberal and conservative, federalist and unitarian, had ceased to have any real relation to the opinions of the persons who bore those appellations. General Falcon, with Guzman Blanco as lieutenant, led a successful insurrection in Coro and made himself undisputed master of a considerable portion of the country. The province of Maracaibo formally declared itself separated from all connection with Caracas. For three years civil war raged, when finally Paez gave up and Falcon assumed direction of the exhausted country. On only one thing had the rapid succession of dictators, provincial and national, been agreed, the increase of taxes. Import duties had been raised to such a point that commerce could stand no more. But in spite of the enormous sums wrung from merchant, producer, and consumer, the treasury was empty, for the local chiefs openly took possession of the receipts of the custom houses in their respective districts, and diversions of public funds to private use were the rule among all ranks of officials. Falcon's success meant the definite triumph of unrestrained federalism. The twenty states into which the seven old provinces had been divided, in the effort to provide enough offices to go around, became in law sovereign. The presidential term was reduced to two years, absolute liberty of the press was permitted, and the right of meeting for any purpose guaranteed. Imprisonment for debt, the death penalty, and religious instruction in the schools were all abolished. During the five years that Falcon was the chief political figure, affairs in Venezuela grew worse and worse. State after state burst into revolution. Falcon sometimes whipped the insurrectionists, and sometimes bought them off but more often was unable to secure even a semblance of obedience, except by conceding everything. National penury reached the limit. The states collected and pocketed the dues in most of the custom houses, officials were in regular partnership with smugglers, and finally the feeble ghost of a federal administration simply flickered out of existence because it could pay nobody. A chief of the so-called Unitarian Party was declared president in 1868, but Guzman Blanco, now the undisputed head of the Federalists, retook Caracas in 1870 and installed himself as dictator. He proved the strongest and most tenacious man who had yet come to the front. With a terrific insurrection raging against him, he concentrated all powers in his own hands, suppressed the peculations of his agents, and relentlessly dragged the half-breeds and negroes into his armies. He finally put down all his enemies, and in 1873 was installed as constitutional president. Until 1889 he virtually reigned over Venezuela, though occasionally he might allow someone else to be elected president. After a short interval he would find a pretext for intervention and oust his nominee. Though the constitution was left substantially unamended, he interpreted it as he pleased. He organized a regular machine through which he governed the quote unquote, sovereign states, taking care that none but his creatures should become governors and that the members returned to Congress should be docile. To all intents and purposes, his will was the law of the land, for the legislative and judicial departments were his instruments and his executive decrees covered nearly every imaginable subject. The minutest details of commercial and social life were regulated, the clergy owed their positions to the dictator, and even private property was not safe if Blanco took a fancy to it. But in the main his tyranny was intelligent. The country escaped the desolating outbreaks of local chiefs, with forced loans wrung from property owners and merchants, the seizure of cattle and coffee for war purposes, and the lassoing of peons to serve in the armed bands. Though the taxes imposed by Blanco were enormously heavy, the marvelous productive forces of the soil could stand almost any burden, provided its amounts were certain and its collection regular. Though the dictator withdrew millions for his private use, depositing them in Paris against the evil day of his expulsion, indiscriminate exactions by subordinates were suppressed. Large sums were spent on public works and buildings, and the beautification of the city of Caracas, 
one of the handsomest and best built cities in America, dates back from Guzman Blanco's time. Nearly 500 miles of railroad were constructed. The country was given and has retained the inestimable blessing of a stable currency, and the coffee and cacao businesses increased enormously. The number of cattle, which the civil wars prior to 1870 had reduced to 1,400,000, increased sevenfold in 15 years. But Blanco's system was anomalous and rested on no secure foundation. The commercial and property-holding classes abstained from politics, and people became tired of his busybody tyranny. The peons were still an inert and ignorant mass, harmless by themselves, but furnishing a tempting recruiting ground for ambitious revolutionists. Nor had the Creole politicians changed their nature. There were plenty of talented adventurers, whose mouths fairly watered seeing the immense fortune Blanco was accumulating, and who only waited a favorable opportunity to conquer a share in the spoils. The successful outbreak came in 1889, headed by Rojas Paul. His success was a signal for other chiefs to imitate his example. Resolute leaders hastily organized bands of peons, and the old story of pronunciamentos, kidnappings of peaceful peasants, attacks, surprises, forced loans, and all the demoralizing and disintegrating horrors of civil war were repeated. Paul was overthrown by Andueza, and in 1892 Crespo got to the head of affairs and held power long enough to accumulate a respectable fortune. Andrade succeeded Crespo, but had to divide the spoils with his predecessor. The disturbances did not become of a character to endure seriously Venezuela's commerce and production until 1896, but there then began a rapid decline in the value of her exports. The government's revenues diminished a third, and amounted to less than half the expenditures. The debt grew to alarming figures, and the guaranteed interest on foreign capital employed in building railroads was allowed to fall into arrears. In 1899, Castro, a man hitherto unknown in politics, started an insurrection against Andrade in the western state of Los Andes. Marching from one town to another, his army grew like a rolling snowball by forced enlistments, and though the sturdy hillmen did not know what they were fighting for, and would gladly have been at home, they showed all the stolid bravery that seems inborn in their race. The government troops could not stand against them, and Castro finally entered Caracas in triumph. Though insurrection after insurrection has broken out against him, the dauntless courage with which he leads his men has enabled him to maintain himself. The successful South American revolutionist must be willing to risk losing his own life, for so long as he leads he will be followed, but his cowardice or death means a rapid dissolution of his forces. Though the solidity acquired by the Venezuelan commercial and financial structure during the long years of Blanco's reign has prevented the country from reverting into the anarchy which prevailed before 1873, and though the spirit of federalism is not so rampant, and the chieftains aspire rather to a control of the whole country than to power confined to their own localities, the recent civil wars have disorganized the finances. Internal production has been hampered, and external obligations have been deferred, the latter with serious consequences. Anti-foreign sentiment, already raised to a threatening height by the boundary dispute with British Guiana, a long-standing matter which was happily settled by arbitration after menacing a serious rupture between the United States and Great Britain, was further exacerbated by the blockade of Venezuelan ports, and the destruction of the Venezuelan navy by the joint fleets of Germany, England, and Italy in 1902, measures to which the European governments had been incited by the failure of Venezuela to settle claims of their citizens. In the face of their foreign war, the civil conflicts were interrupted, and President Castro empowered the American minister to negotiate for the submission of the claims to arbitration. To the weight of the sentiment that international money claims should not be enforced by warlike measures was added the existence of a current of opinion in the United States which favored arbitration as in this instance certainly the best method of adjustment. 
The temporary occupation of ports on American soil by European powers might give the latter a military hold in the western continent which would embarrass and complicate more important relations. The submission was quickly and amicably arranged. The claims of the citizens of other countries are to be ascertained at the same time, and the matter is now before the Hague International Tribunal. By a resolution of Congress, General Castro is empowered to hold the office of President for six years from 1902. Bitter and costly as have been the experiences through which Venezuela has passed during the last twelve years, the vast majority of the intelligent and property-holding classes realize more clearly than outsiders possibly can that internal stability will alone ensure the commercial development of the country that venezuela united is far more likely to prosper than if separated into always jealous and often warring provinces the mass of the people are industrious and peaceable real progress has been made since the time of bolivar in the almost impossible task of adjusting the republican forms and procedure to a people who by inheritance and tradition knew nothing of the difficult art of self-government it cannot fairly be said that venezuela as yet sees her way clear to a solution of the problem but her commercial statistics for the last thirty years prove that her people have acquired industrial capacity and the history of other spanish american countries shows that the power for evil of the turbulent military class may perish once for all with startling suddenness when the right stage in the national development is reached End of section 25section twenty six of the south american republics volume two by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part six colombia chapter one conquest and settlement when alonso de ojeda coasted along the venezuelan shore in the spring of fourteen ninety nine he stopped short just west of the gulf of maracaibo near the present boundary between venezuela and colombia the following year rodrigo batista doubled the guaira peninsula and pursued his voyage to the west catching sight of the giant snow-clad mountains of santa marta and of the lowland which lies between them and the sea coming to the mouth of a great river on the day sacred to saint magdalene he named it the magdalena and further to the southwest found the fine harbour where the city of cartagena now stands at the head of the gulf of darien he came to another great river the atrato and here his explorations stopped more than a year later the great columbus himself on his fourth and last voyage sighted the central american coast at cape gracias a dios near the present boundary between nicaragua and honduras thence he sailed southeast along a pestilential shore for eight hundred miles finally arriving near the point where batista had left off his explorations it is said that bartholomew columbus founded a settlement on the atlantic shore of the isthmus but it was soon destroyed by the neighboring indians the long stretch of coast was unfit for the abode of europeans but the indians had gold in abundance and the spaniards were satisfied that the interior was full of mines hundreds of fortunate adventurers had accumulated fortunes in the placers of haiti and with a view of repeating their successes on the mainland alonso de ojeda solicited and obtained from the spanish crown the grant of the territory from guaira to the atrato while diego de nicuesa was given the coast from the atrato to cape gracias a dios in fifteen ten one of ojeda's lieutenants founded a city called sebastian on the eastern shore of the gulf of darien the indians soon destroyed it but antigua was established across the gulf this place was in fact on the isthmus of panama and not much more than one hundred miles from the pacific ocean of which the spaniards then knew nothing among the military adventurers who had followed ojeda to darien were nunez de balboa and francisco pizarro in fifteen eleven the former went a short distance into the interior looking for gold and fell in with an indian chief who told him that only a few leagues south lay a great sea whose shores were inhabited by numerous rich and civilized nations two years later he headed an expedition from antigua which resulted in the epoch-making discovery which has immortalized his name 
As the band of Spaniards approached the line of hills from which the natives told them they could see the mysterious ocean, Balboa hastened ahead of his men and was the first to catch a glimpse, but in the headlong rush for the honour of first touching its waters he was beaten by Alonso Martin and that lean and tireless soldier who was afterwards to conquer Peru, Francisco Pizarro. The Pacific side of the Isthmus proved to be more healthful and habitable than the marshy shores of the Atlantic, and the settlers at Antigua were soon driven by fevers and dysenteries, torrential rains and sweltering heat to the more healthful region of Panama. Niquesa likewise had been able to do nothing with his long stretch of Isthmian and Central American coast. Nombre de Dios, not far from the present site of Colon, was the only town which he succeeded in establishing, and that maintained itself only as landing place on the way to Panama. To this day the Caribbean coast from the Atrato Delta as far as Gracias a Dios is practically uninhabited by white men. On the site of Antigua there is left not a trace. The Indians in its neighborhood are still independent savages, and the north shore of the Isthmus has been a hospital and a grave for successive generations of white men during four hundred years. Only its position at the strategical gate to the great South Sea has induced men to go to its noisome shores. The Isthmian settlements were, as they remain, separated from the continent of South America by the deep and broad valley of the Atrato, where the rainfall is the greatest known, and whose dense tropical forests are uninhabitable and practically impassable. No land communication exists between Panama and Colombia proper. However, the coast east of the Atrato Delta is drier, and at Santa Marta, beyond the mouth of the Magdalena, and at the foot of the great outlying mountain mass of Colombia's northeastern peninsula, was founded in 1525 the first permanent settlement in Colombia proper. It was nothing more than a kidnapping station, whence expeditions scoured the interior for slaves to be sold to the Haitian gold mines. Meanwhile, from Coro, established two years later, on the eastern side of Maracaibo Gulf, murdering and slaughtering expeditions were sent across the Gulf, returning to Venezuela after making a circuit among the mountains lying south of Maracaibo Bay. Later, these expeditions from Coro penetrated over these mountains, reaching the Llanos of the Apure, and finally the plains of Casanare, lying east of Bogotá, which now belong to Colombia. The exploring parties from Santa Marta and Coro, and information picked up along the coast, gave the Spaniards a pretty fair idea of the geography of the interior, and the existence of immense quantities of gold and of civilized nations living on the high plateaus was verified from many sources. The conquest of the fertile and salubrious interior of Colombia was effected from three distinct centers, Cartagena and Santa Marta on the Caribbean coast, and Quito on the Ecuador tableland. Serious colonization began with Heredia's foundation of Cartagena in 1533. The new leader set vigorously to work to establish himself firmly on the magnificent harbor and seek for gold. Cortes's and Pizarro's marvelous successes had brought a multitude of adventurers to the new world, all of whom were eager for a share in the spoils of the yet independent Indian kingdoms. Heredia found the rocky hills which rose not far south of Cartagena full of profitable gold washings, and the Indians reported that only a short distance in the interior, where the mountains rose higher, there was a region called Zenufana, which produced the precious metal far more abundantly. Their story was true, and Zenufana was none other than the present state of Antioquia, which has produced hundreds of millions of dollars of gold. No time was lost in starting on the search. Heredia's first expedition penetrated to the headwaters of the river Sinu, which flows into the Caribbean not far southwest of Cartagena, and though successful in finding gold, he was unable to force his way over the high Sierra of Abibe, the most northern bulwark of the great maritime cordillera, which barred his way into Antioquia and the valley of the Cauca. In 1535, the town of Tolu was founded between the mouth of the Sinu and Cartagena, and the expeditions skirted the northern end of the Andes until they reached the river Cauca, where it debouched into the Magdalena. 
In 1537 Spanish expeditions succeeded in crossing the formidable Abibe Mountains, and penetrated east into the coveted mining country. Up the Cauca they followed for 200 miles, passing the rapids which place an almost inexpugnable barrier between the upper and lower river. Not far from the present city of Cartago, they found traces of white men and learned that while they themselves had been pushing south, the indomitable companions of Pizarro had extended their explorations and conquest more than a thousand miles north from their landing place on the Peruvian coast. The men from Cartagena went on to Cali, where the conquerors of Popayan had their headquarters, and there an expedition was fitted out which, under the leadership of Jorge Robledo, returned down the Cauca and conquered Antioquia after much bloody fighting with the Indians. It is said that each of Heredia's men received a larger amount than the conquerors of Mexico and Peru. Certain it is that the founding of Cartagena resulted in putting the Spaniards in possession of the valley of the Cauca and the wonderful gold mines of Antioquia as far south as the fifth degree. Ben Alcazar, one of Pizarro's lieutenants, after conquering Quito in 1533, had proceeded north along the Andean plateau between the two cordilleras. A hundred miles from Quito, he entered the high region of Pasto, inhabited by vigorous, semi-civilized Indians, much resembling those of Ecuador. Near this point, the Andes, heretofore massed in one great chain, split into three parallel ranges. The western and central chains are separated from each other by the valley of the Cauca, and near the Caribbean, dip down to sea level. The eastern range bears off a little to the right, with the Magdalena Valley between it and the central mountains, and 600 miles north turns northeast and enters Venezuela just south of Maracaibo Bay. Ben Alcazar went straight north from Pasto and entered the region where the Cauca gathers its headwaters. This was Popayan, a lower country than Pasto, but still high enough to be healthful, pleasant, and densely populated. In rapid succession, the tribes inhabiting the whole upper Cauca Valley were conquered, and Ben Alcazar's officers only stopped when they met their countrymen coming up from Cartagena. The city of Cali was founded in 1536, Popayan in 1538, Pasto and Anserma in 1539, and Cartago in 1540. This beautiful valley is one of the most isolated regions on the globe. To the east and west, the high walls of the Quindio, or Central, and of the western Cordillera shut it off from the Magdalena Valley and from the Pacific, and the rapids near Cartago make communication with the Caribbean almost impossible. Ben Alcazar himself had returned to Quito, and it was not until 1538 that he was able to undertake the conquest of the Upper Magdalena and those lovely plateaus and rich kingdoms which nestled on the broad top of the eastern Cordillera. In the meantime he had been forestalled by an expedition coming from the Caribbean. In 1536 Jimenez de Quesada sallied forth from Santa Marta with 800 men and 100 horses. Avoiding the swampy delta of the Magdalena, he passed through the Chimilas Mountains, which lie east of it, and reached the solid ground of the foothills that approach the river banks some 300 miles above its mouth. Along these he made his way through incredible difficulties and hardships, months being consumed in the journey, and his men perishing by scores from fatigue, starvation, and continual fights with the savage natives. When he reached the river Opon, he determined to climb to the plateau near the site of Velez, where he was told that the mountain top was inhabited by a civilized race. After fighting his way through the unconquerable savages of the Opon Valley, he found himself in the center of a series of lovely tablelands, many of them the beds of ancient mountain lakes, whose alluvial bottoms were inexhaustibly fertile, where the climate was perfect and all the products of the temperate zone grew luxuriantly. The plateaus, interrupted by valleys and ridges, stretched from Pamplona to beyond Bogotá, a distance of more than 200 miles. This region was then, and remains to this day, the populous heart of Colombia, the principal seat of power, wealth, and national civilization. 
However, it is so isolated that it has never constituted a nucleus around which the widely separated provinces of Colombia could unite into a well-organized nation. To reach Tolima, Bogotá's nearest neighbor in the upper Magdalena Valley, it is necessary to descend thousands of feet of steep mountainside along which the sure-footed mule can hardly climb. To reach Cauca, not only must the Magdalena Valley be crossed, but the enormously high Kindio range must be climbed, and before getting to the Pacific, still another mountain chain intervenes, while the populous gold regions of Antioquia can only be reached by following down the Magdalena and up the Cauca. Weeks of the most difficult journeying are required to get to the sea coast or any of the other states, and Panama might as well be on the other side of the globe, so far as practical communication goes. Quesada had lost three-fourths of his men in reaching the promised land, but once there he encountered fewer difficulties than any of the other great Spanish conquerors. The numerous nation of the Chipchas inhabited the southern plateaus, who acknowledged allegiance to the Sipa of Mequeta, but their so-called empire possessed no military force or cohesion, although they had carried agriculture to a high degree of perfection. They manufactured cotton cloths, mined gold and emeralds, worked artistic ornaments, had a circulating medium and a calendar, lived in houses, built splendid temples, and had tools hard enough to carve stones into elaborate sculptures. Their government was absolute, crimes were severely and relentlessly punished, the caste of priests wielded great power. Altogether, they appear to have reached a stage of material civilization not much inferior to the Aztecs of Mexico, the Caras of Ecuador, or the Incas of Peru. But in efficiency of governmental and military organization, they fell far below those great peoples. Spanish chroniclers have amused themselves with recording traditions of great wars in which the Chipchas had assembled armies of hundreds of thousands not long before the conquest, but the fact remains that less than two hundred Spaniards overcame them and reduced them to unquestioning obedience within a few months and without serious loss. Indeed, Quesada's successors had more difficulty with the smaller nations who inhabited the northern plateaus of Tunja, Socorro, and Tundama, and the most serious resistance was made by the semi-savage tribes of the upper Magdalena, who fought nearly as desperately as the Indians of Antioquia and the Caribbean coast. Quesada chose the site of the ancient Chipcha capital for his city, and there Bogotá was founded on the 7th of August, 1538. It lies on the eastern border of a magnificent level plain, the bed of the largest of the prehistoric lakes, 30 miles broad and 60 long, and nearly 9,000 feet above sea level. 150,000 people live on that plain today, and the population in Chipcha times was probably even larger. The same year Ben Alcazar reached the neighborhood of Bogotá, having come down the valley of the Magdalena from Quito and Pasto, and at the very same moment arrived an expedition from Coro in Venezuela, which had crossed the mountains south of Maracaibo and followed south along the Llanos, lying at the eastern base of the Colombian Andes, thence climbing the Sierra to Bogotá. Remarkable as it may seem, these three bands of indomitable Spaniards, starting from widely separated points on the coast, met each other in the remote interior of the continent, brought to the same place by the fame of the fertility and riches of the Chipcha kingdom. The Venezuelans under Federman and the Ecuadorians under Ben Alcazar accepted the bribe which Quesada offered them not to interfere with his conquest, and the three chiefs, laden with gold, returned to Spain in the same ship. Quesada left his brother in nominal command of the colony, but each of the conquerors was a law unto himself. When the governor of Santa Marta came up to Bogotá, they refused to recognize his authority. Tunja and Vélez were founded in 1539 on the plateaus north of the capital, and a year or two later Quesada's brother wasted a great part of his forces in a fruitless expedition to the mountains of Pasto in search of the El Dorado. Meanwhile, in 1538, the Portuguese, Jerónimo Mello, had succeeded in entering the mouth of the Magdalena, making his way for a considerable distance upstream. 
The great river proved to be perfectly navigable from the sea to a point nearly as far south as Bogotá, and the Spaniards immediately utilised it as a route to Santa Marta and Cartagena far preferable to the track through swamps and foot hills which Quesada had followed. Each of the plateau provinces lying on the mountains which follow its eastern bank had its own paths down the slopes of the river, and a practicable, though tedious and expensive, communication with the Caribbean was developed. In 1542, Lugo, an adventurer who had successfully intrigued against Quesada, arrived with a commission as Adelantado and considerable reinforcements. New cities were founded among the gold mines of the Upper Magdalena, at Tocaima, Ibague, and Neiva, as well as at Pamplona, at the northern end of the plateaus. The tribes of Bogota, Tunja, Vélez, Socorro, and Pamplona submitted without appreciable resistance, and their fertile fields were divided into great estates among the Spaniards. But the more savage tribes in the gold-bearing valleys of the Upper Magdalena and Cauca, and in Antioquia, struggled hard to escape impressment into the mines, and war almost exterminated them. The same thing happened on the plains of the Caribbean coast, although in that region some tribes maintained their independence. To work the mines and plantations, Negro slaves had to be imported, with the result that black blood predominates in the lower regions of Colombia, while the descendants of the aborigines are in the majority on the eastern plateaus. Within twenty-five years after the establishment of the first permanent post at Santa Marta, the whites were in undisputed control of practically all Colombia, which is now inhabited by civilized people. Three great territorial divisions corresponded to the three directions in which the conquest had been effected. From Cartagena, Antioquia and the lower Cauca had been settled. From Quito, Popayán, Pasto and the upper Cauca, and Bogotá was the centre of the region extending from Pamplona south along the plateaus and into the valley of the upper Magdalena. This division of the country soon brought on disputes as to preeminence and jurisdiction between the authorities, foreshadowing the demand for local independence which desolated Colombia with civil war during so many years of the last century. Lugo, the new Adelantado, who had displaced Quesada, deprived many of the original conquerors of their grants of land and Indians, and the old and newcomers fell to fighting among themselves. But their numbers were too small to make their disagreements really threatening to the interests of the Spanish crown. In 1545, the Spanish government sent out a commissioner to reduce the country to order. The first royal commissioner was replaced by a second in 1553, who carried things with a high hand, depriving proprietors of their grants, nominating members of his own family to the lucrative posts, and finally even exiling Quesada himself and executing some of the most famous of the original conquerors. Under instructions from Madrid, he promulgated many laws for the protection of the Indians from the exactions and tyrannies of the encomenderos, regulations which, as in Peru, excited great dissatisfaction among the colonists and were constantly evaded. It was forbidden for any encomendero to be military governor of his district, and the original conquerors were replaced in all positions of authority by officials newly brought out from Spain. However, the office of commissioner was an irregular and extraordinary one, and his powers ill-defined. Even at Bogotá, his authority was defied by the Audiencia and the municipal councils, and over the remote provinces of Antioquia and Popayán, Cartagena and Panama, his power was a mere shadow. The Spanish government resolved to erect Quito and Bogotá into presidencies, whose governors would be responsible directly to Madrid and have greater authority over subordinate officials. End of section 26《セクション27 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 6, Colombia. Chapter 2, Colonial Times. In 1564, the President arrived in state with all the trappings appropriate to his high rank. His powers were most ample. He was practically vice-regent of the Castilian king. 
his jurisdiction extended not only over the Bogota Pamplona plateaus and Tolima on the upper Magdalena, but also over Santa Marta, Cartagena, Antioquia, and even to Panama and the Mosquito Coast. The name of New Granada, which Quesada had given to his conquests in honor of his native province in Spain, was extended to the whole presidency. To it were also attached, though loosely, the provinces that now make up the Republic of Venezuela. The access to the Venezuelan coast from Bogotá was so difficult as to prevent that region from ever being really a part of the New Granadan Presidency, and it became an independent Captaincy General in 1731. The eastern boundary of the President's immediate jurisdiction included the provinces which naturally communicated with the Colombian plateaus, but the extension of the Andes northeast from Pamplona along the Venezuelan coast was left to be settled from Coro. For similar reasons, the valley of the upper Cauca, Cali and Popayan, as well as Pasto, was attached to the presidency of Quito, and the subordination of its governor to Bogotá was only incidental and gave rise to many disputes and conflicts. The administrative entity of New Granada may be said to have included the territory which the Spaniards had reached by the line of the Magdalena, and in addition the Cartagena region and the Isthmus. The last named province was a source of constant trouble, because the difficulties of communication and the diversities of interests really made it separate from the rest of New Granada. Panama's governor and independent audiencia frequently defied the commands received from Bogotá. The disorders near Bogotá ceased after the arrival of the first president, Neiva. He actively engaged in promoting new colonization, founding the city of Ocana in the Maracaibo watershed northwest of Pamplona, as well as Leiva and several other towns. He opened a road down from Bogotá to Onda at the head of navigation on the Magdalena, and in his time great flatboats were introduced. These were poled against the river's rapid current, and they continued the sole means of river freight transportation for nearly three centuries. The cornerstone of the Bogotá Cathedral was laid, and schools established, which soon counted among the most successful and famous in Spanish America. The country prospered after a fashion. The fertile plateaus from Bogotá to the north were admirably adapted to the residence of Europeans, and the rich soil soon produced large crops of wheat and fed great herds of cattle. This region was so attractive that the Spaniards became attached to the country and contentedly established themselves as semi-feudal proprietors of estates cultivated by the docile and industrious Indians. A considerable proportion of the successive generations of office holders sent out from Spain applied for land grants and remained in the country, founding new Creole families. Mixture with the aborigines occurred on a large scale, and the process of Caucasianizing the population made greater progress than in many other parts of Spanish America. The region was too far from the seacoast to attract haphazard adventurers or to serve as a botany bay for convicts. The Spanish settlers belonged as a rule to good families, and the standard of living, education, and manners was exceptionally high. Bogotá became one of the principal centers of Spanish-American culture, and Colombian authors are celebrated for their excellence throughout the Spanish-speaking world. In the invigorating climate, the Creoles retained their physical vigor, and the concentration of population on these densely inhabited plateaus increased their mental alertness. Living, however, as a superior class in the midst of a subject population, they acquired no taste or capacity for commerce or industry. A Creole was by birth a gentleman and exempt from manual labor. The Colombian plateaus made little material progress and settled down into an eventless patriarchal existence. Conditions were entirely different in the deep, hot valleys of the Magdalena and Cauca, and on the sweltering seacoast plain. The semi-savage Indians did not make good laborers, and were massacred or driven into the fastnesses on the mountainsides, while their places were taken by Negro slaves. The white population fell into much the same position as it occupies in the West Indian islands. In the mining regions, the Indians were pretty nearly exterminated. 
Antioquia, the great mineral province, has always contained a larger proportion of white blood than any other part of Colombia, and with the decline of its mines it became a centre whence white emigration poured into the other departments. Still different conditions prevailed in the extreme south, where the highlands of Popayán and the dry, cold tablelands of Pasto offered the same aspect as adjoining Ecuador. In those utterly isolated and comparatively unattractive regions, the Indian population remained predominant. In Colombia, as in all the other Andean countries, the impulse toward conquest, expansion and colonization seems to have died out completely with the disappearance of the first generation of conquistadors. We read of the foundation of new cities from time to time, but it usually means that previously existing villages were given municipal charters. After one brief spurt, the Spaniards settled down to enjoy the fruits of their ancestors' heroic marches and battles. Except near Panama, the rainy Pacific coast was left untouched, and the forests of the Amazon in the southeast could not be penetrated. The open prairies of the Orinoco, northeast of Bogotá, could be occupied, and the province of Casanare at the foot of the eastern Andean range became a stock region, inhabited by the same hard-riding, semi-civilized Llaneros as the adjoining Venezuelan plains. The Spanish government applied its restrictive colonial system with the utmost rigor. The obnoxious market tax was imposed as early as 1690. Tobacco and salt were made monopolies. The exportation of agricultural products was discouraged, and the production of gold, emeralds, platinum, and silver was jealously watched and heavily taxed. In the early history of the colony, the profits of mining were prodigious, but during the 17th century, after the cream of the surface placers had been skimmed, progress was slow. The unhealthful climate of the mining regions almost exterminated the settlers. The native population diminished so rapidly that soon the miners were short-handed, and the importation of Negro slaves was so costly that the smaller proprietors could not operate on their own account, and even the great mine owners had to be content with moderate profits. One-fifth of the gross product was required to be paid to the government, and there were other fiscal exactions. The efforts of the authorities to prevent the smuggling of gold introduced a swarm of soldiers, collectors, and guards, with whom the miners were in a constant turmoil. The influence of the church was very powerful, and the population became devotedly Catholic. Great tracts of the best lands were given to the bishoprics and the religious orders. Piously disposed persons left property in trust, charged with the payment of so many dollars a year for the saying of so many masses, and the stewardships, or rights to administer these estates, were the subject of sale or descended from father to son. In 1630, a daring president, Hiron, presumed to arrest and banish the Archbishop of Bogotá, but fifty years later one of his successors wrote back to Spain that, quote, in New Granada there is much church and little king. End quote. The poor Indians were decimated not only by war, massacre, and forced labor in the mines, but the white man's diseases played havoc with them. The smallpox was introduced on the plateaus within a few years after the conquest, and continued to ravage the country throughout the early part of the 17th century. The third president died of the leprosy within a few months after his arrival in 1579, and the first case of elephantiasis, which has proved a curse to Colombia, occurred in 1646. The quarrels and disagreements between the president and the governors and audiencias of the associated provinces, especially Panama, to say nothing of the disputes with the presidents of Quito and the governor of Venezuela, on account of conflicting jurisdictions, became so acute early in the 17th century that the Spanish government determined to erect New Granada into a viceroyalty, extending the power of the Bogota central authorities over Ecuador and Venezuela. The first viceroy was inaugurated in 1719, but he recommended a return to the old system. In the year 1740, the viceroyalty was re-established, and all connection with Peru ceased. 
Although in the meantime Caracas had been made a captaincy general, it was placed nominally under the Viceroy's jurisdiction, and Ecuador was again detached from Lima. Within a few years the attempt to govern Maracaibo, Cumaná, Margarita Island, and Guiana from Bogotá was abandoned, and these provinces transferred to the Venezuelan captaincy general. But the high rank and royal powers of the viceroys did not save them from troubles. They were engaged in an almost continual struggle against the encroachments of the clergy, while the laity protested vigorously at the constantly increasing taxation. A special royal commissioner came out in 1774 to perfect the tobacco monopoly, and five years later another agent arrived with instructions still more irritating. The Creoles of Santander arose in the quote -unquote, rebellion of the communes, and so formidable was the insurrection that the authorities were compelled to make a feint of yielding to the people's demands. They promised to expel the obnoxious commissioner, to abolish not only the tobacco monopoly, but the market tax on the sale of domestic products, the requirement that every shipment be accompanied by a high-priced official invoice, and the poll tax, to lower the stamp duties, the curate's tithes, and the Indian tribute, to cease burdening commerce with unreasonable highway, bridge, and ferry dues, and to require the priests to give up the practice of forcing the Indians to pay for masses. The viceroy also promised to open public employments to Creoles, to permit the establishment of a militia, and to concede to the people the right to confirm the governors nominated by the crown or viceroy. But no sooner had the insurgents dispersed than the government repudiated all these pledges and dragged the popular leaders to the scaffold. The foreign commerce of the viceroyalty had diminished until only one small fleet came each year to Cartagena and Portobello, and though, during the latter part of the colonial period, certain viceroys did something to open up roads by which wheat, sugar, cacao, and hides could be exported at a profit, no measures could prove effective while the enormous fiscal exactions of the Spanish government continued. During the last few years of the 18th century, commerce was made nominally free, but this meant simply that the old prohibitions on private shipments by sea were abolished, and the ports opened for trade with Spain and the other colonies. These wise measures were, however, accompanied by such an increase in taxes that their effect was nugatory. Meanwhile, New Granada had also had her external troubles. In 1586, Sir Francis Drake reached Cartagena, and forty years after the Spanish government fortified the place at great expense. Nevertheless, Ducasse took it in 1695, though Admiral Vernon, with a great fleet and army, unsuccessfully besieged the place in 1741, after having captured Portobello. The unsettled Central American coast, north from the Isthmus, was nominally a part of the Viceroyalty, but had been completely neglected by the Bogota authorities, and in 1698 a colony of 12,000 Scotchmen, with authority from Parliament and backed by a vast popular subscription, landed on the north shore of the Isthmus. They purposed the establishment of a general emporium for all nations on the spot which the great financier, William Patterson, who originated the scheme, regarded as, quote unquote, the key of the commerce of the world. There was to be free trade, the Indians were to be protected, religious liberty was to be established, and the Spanish monopoly of South and Central America destroyed. The far-sighted Patterson hoped to found a colonial empire, and to enrich his own country by the resulting trade. But the enterprise was wrecked by the fatal climate and the supineness of the British government. Provisions fell short, and within a year the survivors re-embarked in a miserable plight. Two small supplementary expeditions arrived in 1699 to find assembled a Spanish fleet and army against which no serious resistance could be made. After a little half-hearted fighting, the Scotchman capitulated, and the colony was definitely abandoned. The Bogota government continued to neglect that coast. It was placed under the jurisdiction of the Captain-General of Cuba, and the claim that Colombia set up after she became an independent nation has never held good against the Central American republics.
End of section 27. Section 27 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 6. Colombia. Chapter 3. The War Against Spain. The stirring events of the year 1808 in Spain and the disorganization of the monarchy produced great excitement in the New Granadan cities. When the news of the establishment of a junta at Quito came in September of the following year, Amar, the Bogota's viceroy, summoned an assembly of the authorities and leading citizens for consultation. The Creoles favored an independent junta, but the prestige of the Spaniards and Amar's popularity prevailed, and it was resolved to recognize the home revolutionary government and to send an expedition to crush the Quito junta. Meanwhile, the Ecuador patriots had dispatched troops to Pasto, but the sturdy conservative mountaineers resented the invasion and repulsed the Quetenos. Thenceforth, to the end of the war, Pasto remained a loyalist stronghold. Though Quito soon laid down its arms under promise of amnesty, the re-established Spanish government massacred the insurgent leaders, and reports of these cruelties threw the creoles of the cities into effervescence, though the Indian and Negro population of the rural districts remained indifferent. On May 22, 1810, the citizens of Cartagena demanded and obtained an independent revolutionary junta. Shortly after, an insurrection broke out among the Llaneros on the Orinoco plains northeast of the Bogotá. On the 4th of July, Pamplona followed Cartagena's example and set up its own junta, and a little later Socorro did likewise. By this time, things were ripe in Bogotá for an anti-Spanish revolution. Ambitious Creoles intrigued among the people. The natural feeling of a jealousy and hatred between Spaniards and Americans became inflamed. A contemptuous remark about Creoles made by a Spaniard in the streets was the signal for the gathering of a great mob, which rushed tumultuously to the public square and howled for an open cabildo and the immediate appointment of a junta. With six thousand armed men in front of his palace, the viceroy had no choice. The junta was named, and a circular sent to the other cities, inviting them to name deputies for a congress to arrange a federal union. But local jealousies, hardly held in check by the rigid colonial system, now flamed forth. The people instinctively grouped along geographical lines, and divergencies of opinion and ambition among leaders increased the confusion. Cartagena and other provinces declined to send delegates to Bogotá, preferring to act independently until the re-establishment of regular government in Spain. When the Congress met, it represented only a part of the territory, and but a small percentage of the population. Nariño and other popular young leaders in Bogotá intrigued for a centralized system in which Bogotá was to be the master province. An insurrection against the junta installed him as dictator, and Congress fled from the capital. The royalists had made no effort to oppose the revolution in the centers of population, contending themselves with sending expeditions from Quito to occupy Pasto and Popayán, with keeping possession of the Isthmus and establishing themselves on the lower Magdalena. Cartagena was thereby isolated from the rest of the revolted provinces, and Bogotá cut off from communication with the sea. In March 1811, the Patriots marched up the Cauca from Cali and defeated the Spaniards in Popayán. Quito rose in rebellion a second time, and the Ecuadorians advanced north into Pasto, only to be beaten once more by the loyalist peasantry. The Granadans, who invaded by way of Popayán, met with no better success and their forces under the command of a North American adventurer, Macaulay, were annihilated. The re-establishment of the royal authority at Quito followed, and Bogotá again lay open to attack from the south. While the royalist reaction was thus closing in around the revolution in central New Granada, the mass of the people cooled, the patriot leaders fought among themselves, and the interior was a prey to anarchy. Dictator Nariño had broken completely with the ambulatory congress, and was sending his troops into the adjacent provinces. 
Congress protested, and a civil war broke out in central Granada. Nariño was defeated in an attack on Socorro, but the Federalists were in their turn repulsed when they lay siege to the capital, and Bogotá declared itself an independent state. In the midst of these disorders, the alarming news was received that General Samano, advancing from Quito and Pasto, at the head of two thousand well-equipped men, had retaken Popayán and was already menacing Antioquia and the lower Cauca. In the face of this common danger, Nariño and Congress came to terms. The latter advanced to meet Samano and badly defeated him at the Battle of Calivio, January 15, 1814. The reoccupation of Popayán was the only result of this victory. Pasto remained faithfully loyalist, a Vendée into which many republican armies were destined to dash in vain. The Spaniards brought up reinforcements, and when Nariño again advanced, his army was overwhelmed and himself captured. However, the loyalists were not able to equip an army large enough to justify undertaking the conquest of central Granada, so the jarring factions and provinces were left alone for the present to waste their energies in internecine conflicts. Cartagena had all the while remained independent, and in 1813 Bolivar, flying from his native Venezuela after the suppression of its first insurrection, took service with the Granadan city. With a handful of militia he drove the Spaniards from the lower Magdalena and retook the important city of Ocana near the Venezuelan border. His unexpected success created such enthusiasm that the Cartagena dictator gave him a small body of regulars and with them the daring Venezuelan began that marvellous campaign which for the second time expelled the Spaniards from Venezuela. His triumph was short-lived, and by September 1814 his forces had been dispersed by the loyalist Llaneros, and he was back in New Granada. He now offered his services to the federated provinces, and in spite of his recent defeats, the prestige of the 1813 campaign secured him the command of the army which was about to march on Bogotá to force that recalcitrant province into the Union. At the head of 1800 men, Bolivar prosecuted the campaign with all his usual activity. The outlying towns of the province surrendered at his approach, and the capital itself, which had been denuded of troops by Nariño for his ill-fated expedition against Pasto, and which in fact was tired of the dictatorship, could not make much resistance. The seat of the federal government was transferred to Bogotá, and the victorious general, though a Venezuelan, became captain-general of its forces, and to his title of liberator was added that of illustrious pacificator. If the adhesion of Cartagena could be secured, the union of New Granada would be well-nigh complete, so with two thousand men he proceeded to the lower Magdalena and established his headquarters just above the delta and within striking distance of the seaport. However, his intrigues with its government led to nothing. Cartagena refused to cooperate with the confederation on any terms, and finally Bolivar made a foolish attempt to besiege the strongest fortress in America without artillery. He soon came to his senses, raised the siege, gave up his command of the Granadan army, and withdrew to Jamaica to wait a new opportunity to make war on Spaniards. The revolutionary cause was in a bad way. The loyalists of Venezuela, Ecuador, and southern New Granada had put down the insurgents in their own provinces. Bogotá was only held back by the military pressure of a few resolute republicans from declaring for the king, and the other provinces were disgusted with civil disorder and wavered in their allegiance. However, they were destined not to be given the opportunity to return peaceably to obedience on reasonable terms. Wellington's peninsular campaigns and Napoleon's fall changed the face of affairs in Spain. Ferdinand once more on the throne of his fathers, and absolute government re-established, all thought of compromising with the American rebels on the basis of autonomy or representation in the Cortes was abandoned. In April 1815, Marshal Morillo, Spain's ablest general, arrived on the Venezuelan coast with more than 10,000 veteran regulars. Having reinforced himself among the Venezuelan loyalists and leaving a large garrison of Spaniards in Venezuela, he proceeded to Cartagena at the head of over 8,000 troops. 
the defenders numbered less than 4,000, but behind the strongest fortifications in America they prepared to make a desperate resistance. So formidable were the walls that Morillo did not try to take the place by assault. His main body landed at Santa Marta and crossed the Magdalena to blockade the city from the rear, while his fleet cut off communication by sea. The besiegers suffered terribly in the pestilential swamps, but the defenders were reduced to the most horrible extremities during four months and a half. The provisions ran out, fevers decimated the people, the starving garrison ate rats and hides, sentinels fell dead at their posts, the commander drove out of the city two thousand old men, women, and children, and of this procession of spectres only a few reached the Spanish lines. Finally, the surviving soldiers escaped by boats in the midst of a storm which dispersed the Spanish squadron, and Morillo entered a deserted city where the very air was poisoned by the rotting bodies of famished people. It is calculated that six thousand persons died of hunger and disease. The Spaniards hunted down and shot the revolutionary leaders. The absolute powers of the governor were revived, and even the Inquisition re-established. While Cartagena was being besieged, a Spanish army advanced along the Venezuelan Andes to the Granadan border and climbed to the Pamplona plateau. There they defeated the local patriots, and the latter fled from the province after killing all the Spanish non-combatants on whom they could lay hands. Desperately alarmed, the Congress at Bogotá made Camilo Torres dictator, and he resolutely advanced with 2,500 recruits against Pamplona. The Spanish general retreated to Ocana, with the patriots following, but receiving reinforcements, turned upon Torres, and on the 22nd of February, 1816, utterly defeated him. The revolution lay helpless at Morillo's feet. The royalist forces promptly occupied the great plateau provinces of Pamplona and Socorro, as well as Antioquia. Bogotá had in fact long been disaffected to the insurgent cause, and now became openly royalist. Torres resigned, and when Madrid, whom the revolutionary chiefs appointed in his place, called for volunteers, only six men presented themselves. Congress dissolved, and the dictator and a few determined leaders, with a remnant of the army, fled north to Popayán. There they joined a band of local patriots under Mejia, and gave unsuccessful battle to General Samano, who had advanced from Quito. This fight of Tambo seemed the revolutionary coup de grace in New Granada, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Only on the plains of eastern Venezuela, and in the Llanos of the Apure and Casanare headwaters, did a few guerrilla bands maintain themselves. In faraway Argentina, the town of Buenos Aires and the Gauchos were still defiant, but elsewhere in all Spanish South America, resistance to the king's generals had ceased. Marshal Morillo fully appreciated how dangerous to Spanish domination in New Granada and Venezuela were the fierce, hard-riding llaneros, uncatchable and unconquerable in the vast Orinoco plains. Fighting on the royal side under guerrilla chiefs, they had beaten the Republicans and Bolivar, but they turned insurrectionists the moment Spanish regular officers assumed command. Morillo resolved to crush the towns completely, and hoped gradually to wear out or exterminate the Llaneros. In pursuance of this policy, all officers above the rank of captain were denied amnesty and shot wherever found. The same fate was reserved for those who had held high civil office during the insurrection. The marshal came to Bogotá in person to see that his bloody orders were carried out. The city's prisons were filled with unfortunates whose wives and daughters pleaded in vain for mercy. The most prominent patriots were shot in the back as traitors, and their bodies hung on gibbets. The great scholar Caldas, the pride of Bogotá for his worldwide reputation as a scientist, suffered a not much better fate. In the capital alone, 125 of New Granada's brightest and best perished on the scaffold, their property was confiscated and their families reduced to abject poverty. Because they had not actively resisted the rebellion, the entire male population were adjudged to have forfeited all civil rights, and gangs of Granadan youth were impressed into the army or, worse still, forced to work on the public roads. 
even the ladies of bogota were sent to country towns to remain under police surveillance with women of doubtful character while thus engaged in stamping out the revolutionary embers in new granada word came to morillo that the venezuelan llaneros had risen against his lieutenants and that bolivar had landed near valencia leaving a garrison of venezuelan and pasto royalists at bogota under the command of samano the marshal with four thousand spanish troops took the plateau road to the frontier carrying with him some prisoners to shoot on the line samano's first act on assuming the government of bogota was to erect a gallows in the great square facing the windows of his palace and to set up four execution benches on the public promenade of the victims who sat thereon with their backs to the firing squad one of the first was the beautiful policarpa salavarieta with seven men also implicated in sending information to the llanero insurgents she died exhorting her companions to meet their fate like men and under the name of la pola her memory is preserved in the songs of the colombian people sixty years after her death the colombian congress voted a pension to her surviving relatives morillo never returned to new granada before he arrived in venezuela bolivar had temporarily retired and the llaneros retreated to the vast solitudes in which they were unconquerable though the spanish regulars won battle after battle their victories were fruitless and bolivar soon returned to venezuela to be again placed at the head of the patriots and to wage unremitting warfare with cavalry from a secure base in the llanos while he imported british mercenary infantry capable of making headway against the spanish regulars from eighteen sixteen to eighteen nineteen new granada suffered hopelessly and silently the bloody despotism of the spanish generals while the tide of war rolled to and fro in venezuela in the early part of the latter year samano sent a small expedition down the steep cordillera slope against the guerillas in the casanare plains northeast of bogota this gave bolivar a great strategical idea he knew that the tableland of new granada had been denuded of troops but it was useless to try and attack from the direction of the provinces south of maracaibo bay because this well-travelled route and its populous towns were in secure possession of the enemy where spaniards could go he could follow so he reasoned and determined to assault bogota directly from the orinoco plains thus striking the centre of the spanish line with a mixed army of british mercenaries and hardy venezuelans the liberator mounted the difficult pass which leads from casanare up to tunja samano had only three thousand troops and these he sent under the command of general barreiro to meet bolivar though the patriots were somewhat inferior in numbers and arrived on the plateau fatigued starving and without horses barreiro not knowing their real numbers hesitated about attacking bolivar was given time to rest and remount his men and then took a vigorous offensive his rapid movements confused the spanish commander and the latter allowed the patriot army to get between him and bogota thus cut off from his base barreiro made a desperate dash to reach the capital but ran against the patriots posted directly across his path at boyacá on the seventh of august eighteen nineteen the loyalists attacked at a disadvantage and without hope after losing a hundred men they fled in disorder and the whole army dispersed or was captured the way to bogotá lay open and samano had no forces to defend the city within three days bolivar had traversed the hundred miles from the battlefield and samano fled in such precipitous haste that he left behind the government archives and even the money in the treasury a month later the whole of new granada except the stubbornly loyalist pasto and the fortress of cartagena was free bolivar had himself made president and military dictator naming santander vice-president and giving each province two governors one military and the other civil responsible directly to bogota the municipal governments were preserved and the spanish system of taxation continued but patriot republicans displaced loyalists in all the offices bolivar soon returned to his venezuelan headquarters on the orinoco to fight morillo and organize the grand republic he had dreamed of so many years 
though all of Venezuela except the Orinoco Valley, all of Ecuador, and the seaports and southern provinces of New Granada still remained in the hands of superior Spanish armies, and although the Creole ruling class had already proved strongly prejudiced in favor of local autonomy and the tearing down of aristocratic forms, his imagination vaulted all obstacles, and he planned the new state down to its minutest details. His idea was a centralized system with himself at its head as life president, backed by a hereditary senate, and ruling the three grand divisions of his empire through docile vice-presidents. But his military power and prestige were insufficient to overcome the opposition of jealous generals and ambitious lawyers. He spent the year of 1820 in futile intrigues among the politicians, and in unsuccessful campaigns against the Spaniards in Venezuela, while the patriots trembled at the news that a great army was assembling at Cadiz, which would surely sweep them out of existence. A liberal revolution in Spain came opportunely to interrupt military operations. Bolivar was obliged to compromise with the advocates of federalism and democracy. A congress representing the Granadan and Venezuelan provinces, then in the hands of the patriots, assembled at Cucuta early in 1821. Composed of ambitious civilians, it was opposed to centralization or military rule, and in spite of the liberator's protests, adopted a compromise constitution. Though Bolivar was conceded the title of president, he was required to give up his civil authority whenever he took command of the army, and this meant an abolishment of the dictatorship. The idea of a life presidency or a hereditary senate was abandoned, and the only part of his system which Bolivar managed to retain was the subordination of the provinces to the central government. The liberator now devoted himself to the direction of the war, leaving that long-headed schemer, Santander, in power at Bogotá as vice-president. The winning of the Battle of Carabobo in Venezuela in June 1821 and the surrender of Cartagena in September made necessary the withdrawal of the Spanish troops from the Isthmus. Panama immediately declared itself independent in November 1821 and announced its intention of joining the great confederation of Colombia, then composed of the provinces of Venezuela and New Granada, and later of those of Ecuador. Pasto alone remained in the hands of the Spaniards. Bolivar determined to expel them from this province, and also from Quito and Guayaquil, while visions of conquests in Peru and Bolivia, and of returning to his dazzled countrymen in Colombia, crowned with laurels gathered on southern battlefields, floated through his mind. Congress gladly gave him leave of absence, and Santander promised supplies of money and soldiers. In 1822 he advanced against Pasto, sending his able lieutenant, Sucre, around by sea to Guayaquil to take Quito from the south. Gathering 3,000 men at Popayan, he marched into Pasto, and on the 7th of April came upon the royal army at Bambona. A bloody battle followed, and Bolivar, by inciting his men to reckless charges, remained master of the field. However, he lost three times as many men as the royalists. The latter retired in good order, and the liberator, after encamping eight days on the plateau, surrounded by a hostile population, hampered by the difficulties of the mountain paths, with a strong enemy in front, was compelled to retreat on Papayan, leaving his sick and wounded. He remained inactive until the glorious news of Sucre's overwhelming victory at Pichincha arrived. The loyalists in Pasto were now completely isolated. The Spanish commander made terms with Bolivar, and the indomitable mountaineers were induced to submit on the promise that they should be allowed to retain their local laws and customs. End of section 28section twenty nine of the south american republics volume two by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part six colombia chapter four modern colombia after bolivar's departure for peru a period of relative quiet ensued nevertheless ambitious local politicians constantly intrigued against santander 
who in his turn was suspected of encouraging Federalist agitation in the hope of overthrowing Bolívar. The United States and England recognized the independence of Colombia shortly after the expulsion of the Spaniards, but foreign troubles arose when the new republic faced the question of paying the immense debt contracted by Bolívar's agents in recruiting and equipping the mercenary troops and buying ships, artillery, and ammunition. This debt had been enormously swollen by the dishonesty of some Colombian commissioners and by the greed of money-lenders who insisted on receiving bonds for double the amount they had really advanced. The temptation to borrow more when it was refunded was too great to be resisted, and Colombia soon saw herself burdened with foreign obligations, amounting to nearly seven million sterling. All the revenues were insufficient to pay interest on this sum, a truly stupendous one for so poor a country. The payments fell into arrears, and though the debt has been scaled down repeatedly, interest has rarely been paid. At the very beginning of her independent existence, Colombia's credit was ruined, and the three countries into which she was shortly divided have remained burdened to this day with the debts then contracted. Their finances disorganized, they attempted operations blighted by the reputation of bankruptcy, and their diplomatic relations hampered by the clamors of bondholders. Santander's administration was further embarrassed by Bolivar's demands for money and troops with which to pursue his conquests in Peru and Bolivia, and still graver difficulties soon arose. Paez, left in command of the army in Venezuela, became involved in disputes with the authorities of the Venezuelan cities and with the ministers at Bogotá, all of whom he despised as mere civilians or as foreigners who had no right to interfere. Finally, in 1826, the central government formally deprived him of his position and summoned him to Bogotá, but a revolution which promptly broke out in Caracas made him dictator. The news brought Bolívar back from Lima, where for two years he had reigned as absolute monarch, leading the life of a voluptuous eastern prince. For the next four years the liberator struggled in vain to repress the rising tide of federalism and radicalism in Venezuela and New Granada. The republican theorists could not forget that he had re-established the convents, placed the schools under priestly control, abrogated government contracts for personal reasons, introduced aristocratic decorations, and schemed for a hereditary senate and a life tenure of the executive nor that his influence had stopped the Cucuta Convention in the path of political reform, prevented the abolition of slavery and capital punishment, and retained the connection of church and state, and the exemption of the army and clergy from civil jurisdiction. Santander was more liberal and a better practical politician. He had shown much ability during the liberator's absence, and risen to be the head of a considerable party. Bolívar succeeded in temporarily crushing some of the opposition in Venezuela and in cajoling Paez, and on his return to Bogotá he made a feint of resigning the presidency. Congress, however, was still under his spell and re-elected him. He then made an attempt to secure legal sanctions for his system by summoning another constituent convention. But news had come of Peru's and Bolivia's defection, and the agitation of the transcendental liberals, the universal desire for local self-government, and the ambitions of a hundred intriguers for high office proved too much for him. A majority of the convention which met at Ocana in 1828 were partisans of Santander and opposed Bolivar's proposal, although the liberator at the head of 3,000 soldiers watched the proceedings. Though he did his best to intimidate the majority, he shrank from frankly playing the role of a Cromwell, and contented himself with ordering his supporters to withdraw, leaving the convention without a quorum. It dissolved, and the country trembled on the verge of disintegration. His friends called an assembly, which obediently proclaimed him dictator. The liberator accepted, and deprived Santander of the vice-presidency. The press was muzzled protesters banished, and military rule established. Some fiery young republicans, determined to emulate the example of Brutus, struck down the palace guards at midnight and rushed into the house to kill the dictator. But his mistress, Manuela Saenz, awakened by the noise, directed him to a window. 
he dropped a few feet to the pavement and ran and hid himself under a bridge while the woman in her night clothes met the assassins on the stairs and told them they could enter only over her dead body they pushed her aside with their bloody hands only to find the quarry escaped the next day bolivar returned to the palace and his spies soon hunted down the criminals santander suspected of knowing of the plot went into banishment and for the moment civil war was averted but the incident did not revive bolivar's waning popularity news came in eighteen twenty nine that paez had again assumed the dictatorship of venezuela this was fatal to bolivar's hopes with new granada in a ferment behind him he could not expect to conquer paez and the formidable llaneros he made a half-hearted attempt to raise an army but recoiled before the insuperable difficulties again he resigned the presidency protesting that he was ready to sacrifice all personal ambition to secure the integrity of the colombian union and the establishment of a strong and ordered government again he was re-elected but meanwhile civil war was raging in ecuador where his own troops disavowed his authority rebellion also broke out in pasto and peru intervened in ecuador and sent a fleet to capture guayaquil and an army to invade cuenca bolivar exhausted his last resources in dispatching troops to meet the peruvian onslaught but the principal result of the war was to put general flores in a position to make himself independent dictator of ecuador despairing of longer maintaining himself but loath to give up his ever cherished idea of union the liberator entered into negotiations with european diplomats to appoint a prince of a reigning family as king of colombia but the idea was impracticable there was no place for a monarch either native-born or foreign on the granadan highlands and venezuela had already virtually separated although a rebellion in antioquia headed by his old companion in arms general cordoba failed in the fall of eighteen twenty nine at the end of the year word came that venezuela had formally declared her independence and had pronounced a sentence of perpetual banishment against the liberator this was the last straw and bolivar made no further resistance to his fate but summoned a congress and retired to his country house penniless sick and heartbroken all his vast estates had been sacrificed to the cause of independence the hardships of his innumerable marches over the cold mountain roads had broken his health and his mode of life during the intervals of peace had not tended to restore it although only forty-seven he was a dying man still he clung to his hopes of vindication and re-election but seeing that even the bulk of his own friends opposed he at last sent in a formal resignation he lived only a few months after a congress had elected mosquera president though bolivar's overthrow was a triumph for the federalists and red republicans congress shrank from going too far and installed a wealthy aristocrat as president however his feeble administration was soon driven from power by the revolt of general urdaneta who made use of bolivar's name as a rallying cry but who in fact was actuated alone by personal ambition the federalists and anti-bolivarists did not leave him long in possession and in may eighteen thirty one he was expelled in his turn obando and lopez both bitter enemies of the liberator during his lifetime and the latter suspected of complicity in the cowardly murder of the great marshal sucre came to the head of affairs new granada's intestine troubles made her too weak to attempt the coercion of venezuela and ecuador so their independence was recognized and the colombian republic ceased to exist a federalist constitution for new granada was framed in eighteen thirty two and shortly afterwards santander became the first legal president unquestionably the strongest man in the nation a good administrator and a shrewd politician he was helpless to check the tendency toward disintegration though he reduced bolivar's army of twenty thousand to less than one half and did much to establish civil administration his energy in enforcing order earned him the title of the quote unquote, man of laws and many granadans regard him as the real founder of their nationality 
Marquez, who succeeded to the Presidency in 1837, was not radical enough to suit the advanced Federalists and Republicans, although the first serious rebellion which broke out against him was caused by his suppression of convents in reactionary and Catholic pasto. At the same time Obando was intriguing against the government, and many of the provincial governors aided the plots. When summoned to trial, Obando fled to the wilds of Papayan and Pasto, and civil war raged through 1839 and 1840. In this latter year, Panama successfully revolted, maintaining its independence until 1842. Thomas Mosquera, the Minister of War, with the help of his son-in-law, General Herran, eventually triumphed over the rebels. In 1841, the latter became president and set vigorously to work to strengthen the power of the central government. By this time, all the people who took any interest in politics had divided into two parties. The liberals insisted on universal suffrage, the separation of church and state, the granting the provinces the fullest autonomy, the division of the greater portion of the national revenue among the provincial governments, and even opposed the theoretical right of any government to impose its will on the individual citizen. The conservatives believed in respecting the clergy, in continuing the old system of education under priestly control, and resisted any further emasculation of the national government. Erran recalled the Jesuits, and under his direction a conservative convention framed a more centralizing constitution than that of 1832. Bolivar's ashes were delivered to the Venezuelan government with impressive solemnities, and his memory apotheosized as the father of the nation and the apostle of centralization. Erran was succeeded by his father-in-law, Thomas Mosquera. During his administration, which lasted until 1849, steam navigation was introduced on the Magdalena, the Panama Railway was begun, the finances were brought into some sort of order, the army was further reduced, and the post office system was improved. The liberals and federalists were constantly becoming more powerful and more discontented. Disturbances broke out from time to time, and when Mosquera's term expired, the attempt to elect a successor in an orderly and constitutional manner utterly failed. Riots and bloodshed followed, and it was officially announced that no candidate had received a majority of the popular vote. The duty of making a choice fell upon Congress, and Lopez, a general of the War of Independence who had taken part in the overthrow of Bolivar, was installed. This meant a resumption of the march towards complete decentralization, temporarily checked during Herran's and Mosquera's administrations. The Constitution was reformed so as to reduce the power of the national executive and guarantee greater privileges to the provinces. The latter was divided and subdivided to suit the exigencies of local politicians until their number reached thirty-five. Lopez had been a revolutionist himself and did not know when he might be one again, and his abolishment of the death penalty for the political crimes met with the hearty approval of the large number of Granadan politicians who were in the same case. The central government transferred a large part of its revenues to the provinces, and gave up to them the control of judicial administration, of education, and of transportation. The tide of liberal legislation also swept over the privileges of the clergy. Laws were voted suppressing the tithes, giving the nomination of parish priests to the civil authorities, taking control of education out of their hands, separating church and state, and establishing civil marriages but it was easier to pass such laws than to enforce their observance by the Granadans. The clergy were enormously powerful among the common people and the conservative aristocrats. The banishment of the archbishop and several suffragans roused the conservatives. Politics became the principal preoccupation of the educated classes. Hardly a village in the country but had its political club, and more than a hundred party newspapers, besides innumerable pamphlets, thundered against their opponents. The conservative revolution broke out in 1851, beginning in Pasto, and immediately spreading over the whole western half of the republic, and even to the eastern plateau. 
Antioquia was the stronghold of the clericals, and there they gathered a force of a thousand men, which was beaten at Rio Negro on the 10th of September, 1851, while the insurgent bands in a dozen other provinces were reduced in detail. Although the Liberal government was thus triumphant in the field, the danger had been too great, and was still too menacing to make it safe to maintain an uncompromising attitude on the religious question. Lopez procured the election of Obando, another political general of the same type and opinions as himself, as his successor in the presidency. The new president's first act was to summon a convention which abolished the last traces of Erran's moderately centralizing constitution, and depriving the executive of the power of naming provincial governors. Obando gave satisfaction to no one, and in 1854 General Melo, commander of the cavalry in Bogotá, incited the garrison and working men of that city to join him in an insurrection. However, the chiefs of the conservative party would have none of him. The recent concessions to the clergy had removed the strongest motives for rousing fanaticism to arms, and the clericals declared in his favor in only a few provinces. The property-holding and educated classes were practically unanimous against him. Mosquera and Erran, the most powerful men in New Granada, and the historical chiefs of the moderate conservatives had modified their views to suit the exigencies of the situation and become in effect moderate liberals it was mosquera himself who led the provincial militia against bogota and overcome the dictator after much bloody street fighting the unhappy country tired of continual internecine disorder and exhausted by the harrying civil wars rested willingly for two years under the compromise administration of mayarino in which representatives of both parties and most of the principal factions had a voice as a matter of fact the federal government had almost ceased to exercise the greatly reduced functions which nominally remained to it the executive had only the shadow of a control over the provinces, its revenues sank to well nigh nothing, its army was reduced to eight hundred men, the very name of the country was changed from the Republic of New Granada to the Granadine Confederation, and the organization of powerful and independent federal departments was begun, foreshadowing the abolition of the old provincial system. In 1857, three candidates had presented themselves ospina representing the clerical conservatives murillo the advanced liberals and mosquera the moderates suffrage had been made universal and under the conditions necessarily prevailing among the population almost entirely illiterate and used for centuries to monarchical and military government a satisfactory election was impossible on the face of the returns ospina received a plurality but the radicals were able to force the adoption of a new federal constitution in 1859, which abolished the old provinces. However, the new system had not the sympathy of the conservative and clerical president. He tried to usurp control of the elections. The liberals accused him of acting unconstitutionally. Insurrections broke out in various parts of the country, and the confusion became worse confounded. In the state of Bolivar, the liberal insurrectionists triumphed, while in Santander, the conservatives themselves started a revolution, which Ospina only succeeded in suppressing by the bloody battle of Oratorio. Meanwhile, Mosquera had become governor of Cauca, and when the conservatives of that state tried to expel him, he beat them and took advantage of his victory to declare himself independent of Ospina. The latter advanced but mosquera defeated him and invaded the upper magdalena gaining the battle of segovia in every state there was an insurrection against ospina and three ex-presidents accompanied the insurgent armies on the surface the civil war appeared to be a mere contest for personal power between mosquera and ospina but the former had ensured a large support by raising the banner of federalism and the latter's triumph would probably have meant a strengthening of the national government and certainly a reaction from the radicalism which had gained ground year by year since the fall of bolivar supported by the clericals conservatives and reactionists ospina fought tenaciously and with a fair prospect of success 
but the Federalist armies advanced relentlessly from both north and south, and one after another the provinces of the eastern plateaus were wrested from him by bloody and well-contested battles. Mojota was finally taken, and the president imprisoned, but Mosquera's opponents kept up the conflict for some time in the state of Panama, Santander, and Antioquia, and it was near the end of 1861 before the Federalists were everywhere triumphant. With Mosquera at the head of affairs, under the title of Supreme Dictator, a Congress was summoned, whose members were called, not deputies, representatives, or delegates, but plenipotentiaries of the sovereign states. The Congress adopted a new constitution, New Granada's sixth since 1830. The triumphant liberals expelled the Jesuits, abolished ecclesiastical entails, extinguished the monastic orders, confiscated church property, decreed the absolute separation of church and state, imprisoned the archbishop, and secularized the schools. Suffrage was made nominally universal, and the death penalty abolished. The name of the country was changed to the United States of Colombia, and it became little more than a league of nine federal states for the purpose of defense against foreign attack. The national government was expressly prohibited from interfering in the affairs of the states, even for the preservation of order, and a clause of the constitution provided that, quote, when one sovereign state of the Union shall be at war with another, or the citizens of any state shall be at war among themselves, the national government is obligated to preserve the strictest neutrality. End quote. The federal judiciary had no power to decide any constitutional question, nor could its decision bind the state authorities. The national government was deprived of half its revenue for the benefit of the states, and the receipts of the latter equaled the federal income. This constitution remained in force for twenty-two years, during which civil wars and factional disputes continually racked Colombia. Moreno, the clerical dictator of Ecuador, had aided Ospina during the civil war, and to punish him, Mosquera undertook a campaign which resulted in a Colombian victory at Quasput on the 30th of December, 1863. However, he desisted from his announced intention of deposing Moreno and installing an anti-clerical government in Ecuador, and granted peace without the imposition of any onerous terms. Murillo was elected president in 1864 for the ensuing two years, to which short period the term had been reduced. The religious question would not down, and he found a conservative revolution going on in the state of Antioquia. It triumphed, and Murillo prudently recognized the successful insurgents as the legal government. He followed this same policy in regard to other revolutions in the states of Bolivar, Magdalena, and Panama, and cautiously refrained from all interventions, even when conservative insurrections occurred in the neighborhood of Bogota itself, or when the clericals of Antioquia invaded Cauca and defeated the liberals. One of the last acts of his administration was to impose on the impoverished federal treasury the settlement of all the forced loans and confiscations made during the three years of terrible civil wars. Mosquera, who succeeded Murillo in 1866, was not content to remain a mere figurehead, although it was under his leadership that the federal system had been definitely established. He bought ships and artillery without authorization from Congress and claimed the power of intervening by force whenever the legal government of a state was unable to maintain order. This attack on the right of revolution outraged the radical republicans. According to their theory and practice, the federal government was merely an alliance between the peoples of the states, but Mosquera's doctrine would tend to make it an alliance between the state governments, creating a ruling oligarchy whose power might be continued indefinitely. Denounced as the assassin of Colombian liberty, he broke off relations with the liberal majority in Congress, and in 1867 assumed dictatorial powers. But the Bogota garrison was suborned by his enemies, and its revolt was followed by his deposition and the substitution of Acosta. The new president renewed Murillo's policy of non-intervention. Colombia had begun to reap a benefit from the increasing foreign demand for tropical products. Exports grew in value, and with them imports and revenue. 
but expenditures grew faster, the poorer States demanded and received subsidies from the Federal Treasury, public buildings and local improvements were planned beyond the nation's ability to pay, and a swarm of employees and pensioners battened on the public revenues. Under the concession of 1850, the Panama Railway had agreed to pay 3% of its net revenue to the government, and the receipts from this source amounted to $14,000 a year. Colombia had stipulated for the right to purchase the road in 1870 for the ridiculously low price of $5 million, but Acosta's administration had no money to invest and was greedy for ready cash. So the franchise was extended until 1966 for one million dollars down and an annual subsidy of a quarter of a million. In 1887, under the pressure of poverty, the installments until 1908 were alienated. Under Gutierrez's administration, 1868 to 1869, when the governor of Cundinamarca gathered troops and assumed a dictatorship, the president deposed him. Even a liberal administration found it impracticable to carry out the theory of non-intervention. An attempt was now made to secure the nation's creditors by authorizing the hypothecation of specific revenue, a measure which left the administration in sufficient means to meet ordinary running expenses. Under Salgar, 1870-1872, to the acknowledged deficits amounted to 50% of the total revenue, the increasing revenues had proven a curse instead of a blessing, for the demands of the states and officials were insatiable, and the sums spent in subsidies and internal improvements grew beyond all reason. Meantime, the most extreme and unrestrained liberalism dominated the politics of the country. Congress passed a formal vote of condolence for the death of Lopez, Paraguay's unspeakable tyrant, who had just succumbed to Brazil and Argentina after having devoted to destruction nine-tenths of his people. All honorary and useless military titles and employments were abolished, and the law on that subject contains the following curious provision, quote, In naming the eight generals spoken of by the Constitution, from whom must be chosen the commander-in-chief of the army, all Colombians over twenty-one shall be considered as generals of the Republic. End quote. Murillo was elected for a second term in 1872, and at once devoted himself, and with considerable success, to the reorganization and regulation of the finances. The law of 1868, which had hypothecated the revenues to meet the charges of the public debt, was repealed and the foreign bonds were scaled down to less than one-third their face. By such measures the President succeeded in paying the government employees and taking care of pressing home necessities, and even showed a nominal surplus at the end of his term. During the administration of Santiago Pérez, 1874 to 1876, the first mutterings of the terrible storm of civil war soon to burst over the country were heard. The state of Panama defied his authority and imprisoned his officers, but he applied conscientiously the constitutional doctrine of non-intervention and disavowed a general who on his own responsibility had deposed the governor. The governor of the state of Magdalena took possession of the custom houses at the mouth of the river, and the troops of the state of Bolivar attacked federal detachments passing along the Magdalena a river which is interstate, and whose navigation was free by the terms of the Constitution. The popular election of 1879 was so disturbed that Congress assumed the power of selecting a president, and Parra was installed the following spring. An internecine conflict broke out in Cauca. The president started to intervene, and the states of Antioquia and Tolima declared war against him. Although guerrilla bands in Cundinamarca, Boyacá, and Santander menaced the government's rear, 25,000 recruits were raised and sent against the rebelling states. Antioquia was beaten at Chancos and Garrapata, and the rebels of central Colombia at La Don Juana. In battles where the largest numbers of soldiers ever gathered on Colombian soil were engaged. Peace was followed by a general amnesty, 
because the victorious Liberals dared not proceed to extremities against their adversaries. Trujillo was installed as president without opposition, and the harried country recovered somewhat from the exertions and disasters of the terrible year of 1876. The finances were, however, in terrible disorder. Expenses amounted to enormous figures. The deficits became greater than the total revenues. Interest on the public debt, which had been regularly kept up since 1873, was indefinitely suspended. Disturbances soon began to break out again, and the National Guard deposed the governors of Cauca and Magdalena. The president showed an inclination towards centralization. He formed alliances with state governors, encouraged them to prolong their terms, and systematically fostered divisions in the Liberal Party. Trujillo was succeeded by Núñez, nominally a liberal, but who at heart had also sickened of the federalist system and was looking for an opportunity to strengthen presidential prerogatives. The constitution stood during his first term and those of his two successors, but when he was re-elected in 1884, the policy which he followed soon caused him to be denounced by the liberals as a traitor to the constitution. The failure of a liberal insurrection in 1885 was followed by a complete unitarian and clerical reaction. In 1886 a new constitution was adopted, which substituted a consolidated republic for the loose confederation. The country's name was changed from the United States of Colombia to Republic of Colombia, in order to express the dominating principle of the new regime. The sovereignty of the individual states was expressly denied in the document, and the two most refractory ones, Panama and Cundinamarca, temporarily reduced to territorial dependencies. The governors were named from Bogotá instead of being elected, and the right of federal intervention reaffirmed. Suffrage was limited by an educational and property qualification. The clergy were admitted to participation in politics, the Roman Catholic was declared to be the national religion, although individual freedom of worship was permitted. The presidential term was extended to six years, and an attempt was made to ensure judicial independence by a life tenure. Under this constitution there was, for a long time, less disorder. In Colombia, political hatreds are, however, incredibly virulent and persistent, because party differences are fundamental and irreconcilable. The clericals regard their opponents as pestilent enemies of religion and order, and the liberals anatomize the ruling party as a reactionary, corrupt, and benighted oligarchy. The exiled liberals have made repeated efforts to regain power, and the administrations have not been able to avoid a constantly mounting national expenditure and the continuation of deficits and repudiation. In 1899, a formidable insurrection, aided from Venezuela, broke out. President San Clemente was imprisoned, and in 1900, Vice President Marroquin assumed the executive functions. This terrible civil war ended only in November 1902, when the insurgents surrendered their fleet and stores. President Marroquin and the conservative government seem now firmly established, packed as they are by the tremendous influence of the church among the masses. The people are returning to their usual avocations, though business has been demoralized by the stupendous deprecation of the paper currency. The vast expenditures of the French Canal Company boomed Panama, but the resulting prosperity was confined to the isthmus, the Bogota government hoped for a great increase of income when the canal should be completed, and the abandonment of the enterprise was a disappointment. The principal subject of public preoccupation during 1903 was the negotiation with the United States concerning the permission desired by the latter to continue the work. Colombia proper has its outlets down the Magdalena to the Caribbean and therefore has no greater special commercial interest in the building of a canal than Venezuela, Guyana, and Cuba. But the Colombians of the continent regard the possession of the isolated Isthmian region as their most valuable national birthright, and believe that this invaluable strategic position should be used so as to obtain the utmost possible advantages for the Bogota government, as well as for the people of Panama. 
The revenue from the Panama Railway had been one of the important sources of government income, and the ruling political classes considered that they were entailed to have this income largely increased if a canal was built. The special Congress summoned to consider the treaty already signed by the executive failed to ratify the agreement and adjourned, after empowering the president to try and negotiate a new one which would give Colombia a larger bonus and revenue. But the rejection of the treaty was followed by a declaration of independence on the part of the people of Panama, who believed that the United States would pay no larger sum than that already agreed upon, and who saw their own interests being sacrificed for the sake of a far distant interior region with which they had few commercial ties, and whence invasion and coercion need not be feared, because of the lack of practicable routes of communication. The United States and other powers promptly recognized the new nation, which at once made a canal treaty similar to that rejected by the Bogota Congress. At Bogotá, the first impression was one of profound dismay. The executive offered to declare martial law, suspend the constitution, and ratify the rejected treaty in spite of the Senate. General Reyes, the foremost living Colombian, immediately departed for Panama as a special envoy to endeavor to persuade the people there to return to their allegiance, but his overtures were rejected, and he went to Washington on the hopeless errand of inducing the United States government temporarily to abandon its policy of forbidding fighting on the Isthmus, so that Colombia might reduce the people of Panama to obedience. Meanwhile, many Colombians blamed the Marroquin administration for the irreparable loss of Panama and ten million badly needed dollars. Some popular demonstrations occurred, and the hot-headed demanded that war be declared against the United States and an army marched across the Atrato swamps to attack Panama from the land. But the financial and topographical difficulties were so evidently insurmountable that the war talk soon died down, and demonstrations against the government ceased, and most elements seem to have acquiesced in the election of General Reyes to the presidential term which begins in 1904. It will be under his able guidance that Colombia will start on the tedious road leading to internal peace and regeneration, to financial rehabilitation, and to the reconcilement of those fierce factions whose wars have drenched their country's soil with blood for so many decades. End of section 29「Section 30 of the South American Republics, Volume 2, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 7. Panama. The Events Leading to Independence. The history of Panama is for the most part identified with that of Colombia, which is narrated elsewhere in the present volume. It will, however, be convenient to review certain movements and tendencies of the last half-century in order to obtain a just understanding of the position and prospects of the new republic. All the principles of advanced democratic government were included in the program of the party, which ruled Colombia from 1863 to 1883, and the statute books of the time afford ample proof that the leaders earnestly tried to put those principles into practical effect. They dreamed a utopia, but practically their efforts only aggravated the anarchical tendencies bequeathed by the Spaniards and Bolivar. Colombian liberals still insist that the persistent enforcement of the Constitution and principles of 1863 would ultimately transform the character of the people, that religious bigotry and priestly influence would gradually disappear, that the progressive enlightenment of the masses would make military despotism and revolutions impossible, and that in process of time the relations of the states to the federal government would reach a satisfactory and workable basis. But so far as the experiment went, no progress was made toward unifying the nation and pacifying the adverse elements. Discontents, disorders, civil wars increased in violence as the years went by. Though one-fifth of the federal revenues were spent on the public school system, and one-tenth of the children were nominal attendants, the clergy were permitted to have no share in their control, and retaliated by excommunicating the parents. 
the devotedly pious Creole mothers and wives, threatened with the closing of the confessionals and the denial of absolution, threw their incalculable influence against the atheistic government. The destruction of the convents and the confiscation of the vast ecclesiastical estates violently changed the ownership of two-thirds of the land in the confederation, but this imposition of new landlords on the industrious, oppressed, half-enslaved tenantry did not much modify real agricultural conditions. No extensive subdivisions of estates resulted, and the Creole aristocracy continued to pay more attention to political intrigue than to improving their property. No less disappointing in its practical working was the independence of the states. Not only did the local bosses constantly abuse autonomy for their own selfish purposes, but the presidents at Bogotá often ignored the constitutional rights of the states and selected for coercion precisely those states which were farthest from the capital and most needed wide autonomous powers. Though Panama's position was isolated, its population cosmopolitan, its commercial interests and social structure peculiar, and though in colonial times its dependence on Bogotá had only been nominal, the liberal presidents usually ruled it like a conquered province. Members of the Andean oligarchy poured in to button on its revenues. The autonomy guaranteed by the constitution proved illusory and discontent led to repeated efforts to achieve absolute independence. Rival ambitions among its own leaders furnished, however, the immediate cause for the downfall of the Liberal Party. A close oligarchy grew up, and that inevitable corollary, a powerful faction of dissident Liberals, while the clericals remained formidable and irreconcilable even after their bloody overthrow in 1876. Rafael Núñez, a brilliant writer, a resolute and ambitious party chief, and a leader in the confiscation of church property, had been defeated in his candidacy for the presidency in 1875. The younger and dissatisfied liberals rallied behind him in his war against the oligarchy, and in 1880 the old-fashioned liberals could not prevent his election to the presidency. He vigorously strengthened the prerogatives of the federal executive, and built up his personal following, but although the issue of paper money and the discontinuance of interest on the foreign debt, a debt which only ten years before had been scaled down to ten million dollars, one-sixth its original amount, on a solemn promise that at least this much would be faithfully paid, placed large funds at his disposal, the old-line liberals were strong enough to prevent his re-election in 1882. Their victory was illusory and temporary. Núñez controlled both houses of Congress and was able to block President Saldúa at every turn. Eighty years old and in feeble health, the latter died after a year of fruitless struggle. After a short ad interim administration in which Núñez's influence predominated, he was re-elected to the presidency and installed in 1884. By this time his centralizing tendencies were manifest, and the measures he adopted unmistakably pointed to the substitution of a unified republic for the old loose confederation. Many of his liberal supporters fell away, and he was driven into an alliance with the conservatives. Appointments of members of that party to important positions were followed by the Great Revolt of 1885. The insurrectionists delivered their main attack on the Caribbean coast, whither the importation of arms was easy. Much of the department of Magdalena fell into their hands, and they besieged Cartagena in force. But when one of their expeditions invaded the Isthmus, burning Colon, and interrupting traffic on the Panama Railway, the president appealed to the United States, as previous presidents had done in similar cases, to carry out the guarantee of free transit contained in the Treaty of 1846. At the same time, the government troops attacked and defeated the isolated insurrectionists at Colon, and shortly afterwards the latter's main army suffered a bloody repulse in an assault on Cartagena. This broke the back of the movement against Núñez, and the liberals abandoned the hopeless struggle. The insurrection had been undertaken for the purpose of defending the 1863 constitution, and its defeat meant the destruction of departmental independence. 
As the logical and natural result of his victory, the President proclaimed the abolishment of the Constitution and summoned a convention to adopt a new one. Thenceforward, until his death ten years later, Rafael Núñez and his political ideas were supreme in Colombia, and Panama was held in the most rigid subjection. The old United States of Colombia were replaced by the Republic of Colombia, one and indivisible. The departments became mere administrative divisions, whose governors were appointed from Bogotá. The presidential term was increased to six years. The radical liberal projects were abandoned. The clergy regained many of their privileges, and the historical conservatives continued the dominant party. As long as Núñez lived, there were few outbreaks and no serious civil war, though the ousted liberals never ceased to plot the government's overthrow. The centralizing system held the departments in a rigid control from whose inconvenience Panama suffered far more than the mountain districts. Practically she was allowed no voice in either her own or general affairs. The very delegates who nominally represented her in the Constitutional Convention of 1885 were residents of Bogotá, appointed by Núñez. Military rule became a permanent thing on the Isthmus. All officials were strangers sent from the Andean Plateau, and the million dollars of taxes wrung each year from the people of Panama were spent on maintaining the soldiers who kept them in subjection. In January 1895, the harassed province broke out in a rebellion which was suppressed by an overwhelming force of Colombian troops in April. Meanwhile, in Colombia proper, the opposition to the ruling clique grew stronger and stronger. Persecution united the liberals, and they began organizing for revolt all over the republic. The conservatives themselves divided into two parties, one of which opposed the administration. Núñez did not live to finish the second term, to which he had been elected in 1892, but his successor managed to suppress the premature revolt of 1895, and in 1898 San Clemente was elected, the opposition refraining from going to the polls. The new president soon found his position very difficult, and, unlike Núñez, was unable to dominate his own party and hold the opposition in check. The French Canal Company, whose concession, granted in 1878, would expire in 1904, offered a million dollars for a renewal, desiring to recoup, by a sale to the United States, a part of the 200 millions sunk by De Lesseps. San Clemente's government wished to accept, but the opposition, and even the Conservative Congress, insisted on the forfeiture of the French rights. The administration rapidly lost prestige, the discontented elements saw their opportunity, and the long brewing storm now broke on the hapless country. The liberals hurriedly completed their preparations, and in the fall of 1899 a civil war began, the most terrible and destructive that had ever devastated the Republic. Before it ended in 1902, more than 200 battles and armed encounters had been fought, and 30,000 Colombians slain. The detailed history of the campaigns had not yet been written, but it is apparent that the insurrectionists at first gained many successes. The president declared martial law, suspending the functions of Congress, and the extension desired by the French Canal Company was granted by executive decree. But the pecuniary relief thus obtained did not materially help the floundering administration. San Clemente became a mere figurehead for his more resolute ministers, and in July 1900 the vigorous vice-president, Marroquin, seized power by a coup d'etat, throwing San Clemente into a prison, where he remained until his death. Thereafter the war against the rebels was prosecuted with more energy, and the tide turned with the defeat of an army of Venezuelans, 8,000 strong, which had invaded the eastern provinces to cooperate with the insurrectionists. However, the liberals were still strong in the west and north. On the isthmus, four insurrections had broken out from October 1899 to September 1901, and though each had been promptly suppressed, in 1902 the liberals were able to make a last great effort to establish themselves at Panama. 
they had considerable forces near the mouth of the Magdalena, and gunboats on the Pacific. The secure possession of the Isthmus would have enabled them to reinforce this Magdalena army, cut off Marroquin from the sea, and undertake a campaign against the interior. At first all went well for them. Their gunboats captured the government's vessels on the Pacific side, they concentrated a respectable army there, and finally defeated and captured 2,000 of Marroquin's troops at Agua Dulce, near Panama. But this was their last success. Marroquin poured reinforcements into Colon, and though the American admiral at first refused to allow them to be transported over the railroad to Panama, permission was granted when it became evident that there would be no fighting near the line. News came of the defeat of the liberal army near the Magdalena, and General Herrera, the victor at Agua Dulce, found himself isolated. In desperation he sent an expedition in October, which surprised and captured Colon, but French and American marines were promptly landed to prevent fighting in that city. The expedition had no alternative but to surrender, and a few days later General Herrera, with the main body, capitulated on the Pacific side. The three years of war left Colombia in frightful demoralization. The victorious government was little better off than the defeated liberals. Commerce and industry had been prostrated. Revenues dwindled to nothing. The paper currency was worth less than one per cent. The exhaustion of its adversaries, not its own strength, enabled Marroquin's government to continue in power. In such a situation, the administration welcomed the opportunity, which now offered, of renewing the building of the Isthmian Canal. The United States government determined to undertake this great work itself, and finally decided in favor of Panama, as against the Nicaragua route. Forty million dollars was agreed upon as a just price for the work already done by the French company, and nothing remained but to obtain Colombia's consent to the transfer. The civil war helped to delay the negotiation of a satisfactory treaty, but as soon as it was over, the Marroquin administration lost little time in coming to an agreement with the United States. Colombia was to receive a bonus of ten million dollars for consenting to the transfer and enlarging the terms of the original concession. Her sovereign rights were reserved and guaranteed although she agreed to police and sanitary control of the canal strip by the United States. When this treaty was submitted to the Colombian Senate for ratification, opposition developed, which the administration was not strong or resolute enough to overcome. Among the politicians at Bogotá, the opinion was almost universal that the executive should have demanded more. The Colombian people have ever regarded the political control of the Isthmus as their most valuable national heritage, and cherished extravagant hopes that some day they would be vastly enriched by the sale or rental of this strategic bit of ground for its natural use as the greatest artery of the world's commerce. Many now insisted, as they had done in 1898, on enforcing a forfeiture of the French rights, or at least on receiving a proportion of the forty million dollars to be paid for them. It was also said that the Americans could well afford a larger bonus, and the opponents of the treaty made the further point that the agreement was unconstitutional and contained insufficient guarantees of Colombian sovereignty. Against this storm, the feeble administration probably could do little, and certainly did nothing. The Senate was allowed to adjourn without ratifying the treaty, and an attempt was made to negotiate a new one, providing for a larger bonus and more stringent guarantees of Colombian sovereignty. The United States, however, absolutely refused to consider any other terms than those already agreed upon, and the civilized world saw the completion of an enterprise promising incalculable benefits to mankind indefinitely postponed by the opposition of Andean provinces, whom the accidents of war and international politics had given an arbitrary control over a region with which they had no natural connection. The situation was particularly hard for the people of the Isthmus, whose confident hopes were now disappointed of at last receiving, by the prosperity which would follow the building of the canal, some compensation for the oppression and losses they had suffered during eight years of misrule by the Bogota oligarchies. 
Hardly had the treaty been rejected when plotting for a declaration of independence began. The resident population was unanimous, and good grounds existed for believing that even the Columbian garrison would offer no resistance unless reinforcements should come from Bogotá. In case of an armed conflict with Colombia, the people of Panama could count on the sympathy of all America and Europe. The stockholders of the French company had a direct pecuniary interest in their success. If once they could establish independence and a de facto government, Colombia could not deliver an effective attack without violating the neutrality and security of transit guaranteed to the Isthmus by the United States. Everything pointed to the success of a well-conducted movement. Though the preparations for the revolt could not be concealed, the Bogota government took no effective measures to forestall it. Warned that trouble was impending, the United States sent ships to prevent fighting that might interfere with transit. The new republic was proclaimed at Panama on the 3rd of November, 1903. The Colombian authorities made no resistance. The garrison surrendered without firing a shot, and the entire population acquiesced in the appointment of a provisional government, pending the calling of a convention and the adoption of a constitution. A small force of Colombians had been landed at Colon, but the revolution at Panama found it still on the Atlantic side. On November 4th, the American naval commander refused to give these troops permission to use the railroad for warlike purposes. Because the vital portion of the new republic is virtually neutral under the Treaty of 1846, the provisional government, having established itself in peaceable possession, was safe from external attack. The useless Colombian troops at Colon either joined the people of Panama or retired. The inhabitants of Colon and the outlying districts immediately sent in their adherents, and the peace of the whole Isthmian region remained unbroken. On the 13th of November, the United States recognized the new republic, being followed by France on the 18th, and then by all other nations, as soon as diplomatic formalities could be complied with. Dr. Manuel Amador Guerrero was elected first president of the Republic of Panama, being inaugurated on February 1904. A treaty with the United States for the building of the canal was framed on substantially the same lines as the one which had been negotiated with Colombia. By the end of February it had been ratified and proclaimed, and the United States at once made preparations for the beginning of the work. End of section 30 End of South American Republics, Volume 2 By Thomas Cleland Dawson